This is gonna be so cool today, God. <laughs> you do realize what's about to happen, right? Yeah. Can I ask questions? No, you can listen though. Name, Tari and J. Royal. Age, 38. Number of awards I've been shitted on, countless. First of all, my work is far more cut out for me than it is for him. First, what, how do you think, what, how would you describe me, my, my character, if I were on a uh, cast sheet? Not only are you play, playing one of the greatest non-known actors of all time, mm -hmm. you're playing your friend. If you don't do this performance, I'm fully prepared to take over being me and being you at the same time doing this full fucking episode. I want to say that right now. What do I think he's going to do? The best he can. I mean, in fairness, no one can do me. I've been fucked, but no one can do me. I have to ramp way up while he gets to ramp down at a, at a nice lull. Your pussy rig is about to go way up when you step into my shoes. The key part is sacrifice. I'm a retired whore. I don't do that anymore. It's all about my career. Okay? Okay. And if you didn't think I was serious, I was. Can I ask a question? <laughs> That's a question. No. <laughs> you have to hate yourself as much as you hate everybody else. And your posture is all wrong. Is this too cool? Yeah. Like I'm about to get blue? You have to sit like you have something up your ass, <laughs> but also your neck is broken, and you're trying to stamp out a little fire on the ground the whole time. <laughs> I mean... He has to toe the line between black pace and black face. I, I, I think that uh, I don't think he's going to be able to do it. Like this is Rick, this, this is my life, this is my fucking career we're talking about here. Uh, what is your motivation as a human being? <laughs> the only person I can really see playing me pulling it off is me. I don't think he's going to be able to uh, to Ben Kingsley downshift to the degree that is needed to become Durden Godfrey. What goes what? What's your problem with bitches? I got a problem with bitches. You should ask them their problems with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're me. <laughs> what? No, the camera's rolling. I thought we were getting the camera. I need to know everything. We're not going to be fucking. No, we're not going to be fucking this up. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a medic at your Hans. While anybody else is talking, you have to be listening to them 25%, but listening to your brain 75%. That's Accurate. Good. Oh, damn. All I'll just say is this, Dave. Um, hey, good luck. I don't think he has it in him to be this minimal. <laughs> so I got it. So. Think, think more about what I'm saying, listen 25% of the time, and overread the script, and smile and nod a lot, and be like, I'm just gonna wait for Rory to finish like a soft porn, and then I'll go. Yeah, Move my I'm knee. sorry, I was doing that thing, bro. I was, I was, I was <laughs> listening. No, but to quote George Constanza, it's not a lie if you believe it. That's what I'm saying. Everything that comes out of your mouth, it can't be hesitation. Just go, go. There are no speed bumps, there are no exits, there are no lights. Only lights are the grid, it's only one light in this grid. We're always on go. It's it's his it's his greatest role yet. I'm real. Cause I'm it. Me, I'm it. It's MIT. Me, I'm it. And that's the fucking trigger. Oh, my job is so much harder than yours. <laughs> I'd like to take his his face. Three, two, one. What the fuck is up, Internet? My name is Mr. Royal. Sitting right next to me is my man, D. Take it away, D. How are you feeling today? I am feeling good. My name is Durden Godfrey, and we'd like to welcome you guys back. First and foremost, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors here today. My all of our sponsors. I mean, 
None. All right, let me do that a little bit better than you because you fucked it all up. We we want to thank all of our <laughs> all of our patrons, all of our patrons. You guys make us be everything that we can be. So hey. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Mr. Royal. Guys, today we're covering one of the all-time classes. Today we'll be covering the movie Face Off. Now, as you know, Face Off does star Mr. John Travolta and. What's the last time we've heard that word? Star and John Travolta. Hold on one second. You said we're doing face off today. Yes. Okay, sure. All right, I'm ready. Go. Three, two. All right, so today we're doing face off. <laughs> what, you didn't know we were doing face off today? No, I knew. I sent the notes. Did you not look at them? Because they were clearly sent to you. Yeah, I got them. And I'm ready. I am here. I'm real. All right, guys. So listen, guys, let's you know what we're going to be doing today. We want to thank everybody for coming back to the show. It's been a while. We're going to have some really good fun with this today. And to be honest with you, I'm I'm not feeling comfortable today because of the fact that everyone knows I'm an atheist and I'm wearing this this get up. And I, I I'm just got to lean on Royal today to really bring us home. All right. And look, you know, I know that you love to look at us, but how much better is it to hear us? Oh, yeah. Listen to this. We sultry boys. You can find us on all of the podcast platforms, wherever you get your podcast. So check that out. Face Off was released in the U.S. on June 27, 1997. And that's right. Films released around this time was Hercules. Ernest Goes to Africa. Why would you make me say that? They're going to accuse me of being some type like of racist or something. Well, I didn't want to take it. Okay, well, that's what As she said. I get it. Rob Lowe, James Belushi starred in a film called Living in Peril. One of my favorite actors, one of the guys I looked at who I really looked in my mirror every day and said I wanted to be like, Keanu Reeves. Um, actually, Thomas Jane and Adrian Brody starred in The Last Time I Committed Suicide. And the Joel Schumacher classic. And I mean classic. Hold on, let me take that back. Let me take that back. Three, two. In the Joel Schumacher classic. Batman and Robin with Arnold Schwarzenegger is the best villain ever. What, who would be Batman? Who would be Robin between us? Oh, I'm definitely Batman. Today you are, my friend. Today you are. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm sitting next to my best friend's wedding. And speed to cruise control. More like curse control. Cruise right <laughs> out of the radar of all of the fans of Speed. Alright, and then we got Buddy, not to be confused with Elf. Buddy! Just Buddy. And Con Air, of course, also starring Nicolas Cage, came out 21 days before Face Off. <laughs> Nicolas Cage essentially was up against himself in the box office, which brings us to a special segment called Nicolas Cage is a Busy Motherfucker. In 40 years, Nicolas Cage has starred in 109 films. He hit the ground running in the 80s, starring in 14 films from 81 to 89. From 90 to 99, he collected 20 more credits. The late 90s was a great half decade for Nick with Leaving Las Vegas in 95, The Rock in 96, Con Air and Face Off in 97, City of Angels and Snake Eyes in 98, and 8mm and Bringing Out the Dead in 99. He did 24 projects from 2000 to 2009. Nine of those were completed in just two years. He really picked up speed in 2010, gone in 60 seconds if you should say. Starring in exactly 40 roles from then until 2019. We are only two years into the new decade and he already has five films completed, four films in post-production, a film in pre-production where he is cast as Dracula, and has announced an Amazon Studio TV series on the internet of Amazon. If you are a fan of Nicolas Cage, you are literally dripping in content. I nailed that. Did I just not fucking nail that, brother? You fucking nailed it, man. I am so proud for two reasons. Number one, number one is you read the notes. Like, I send these things all the time. I'm up. Oh, I don't read them. They read me. This is true. But I mean, Angela, she's there cleaning the house. I have Adam Lyon, and she's running around listening to your silky fucking chocolate voice all the time. And now I, I'm just happy. The second reason I'm happy is because. I now know what Wesley Snipes should have did to avoid tax evasion. Clearly, Nicolas Cage was like, I I got so much money that I owe that I am going to do all these films because I'm not on the IRS anything. Now, if you guys didn't know this, this was directed by the great John Woo. And John Woo also directed Hard Target, Broken Arrow. I haven't seen these. Uh, the, I believe it's Mission Impossible 2. 
Paycheck, and 39 other films uh, that Nicolas Cage was probably also in. Starring. I, you didn't read all the notes? No, I read them. Did we do written by already? Well, yeah, we did. I did it because I read it, and if you would have read the notes when I sent them to you, you wouldn't be asking me that. Oh, then you went right into directed by. I surely did. Yes. Well, what's going? What's going on with you, man? You saw, what are you drinking? Well, I thought I was black, and now we're canceled again. Father, 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 royal. Could you? Could you? Could you keep it on script? <clears throat> you cannot cheat, Father. Crime time. What the hell does that even mean? I don't know, man. Face Off stars John Travolta <laughs> as Sean Archer, Nicolas Cage as Cash. So you're reading Shore. my lines nine too, because it's that's A and B. Hey, somebody's got to read them. All right, there we go. Joan Allen as Eve Archer, and Alessandro Nivola as Pollux Troy. Gina Gershon as Sasha Hessler. Was that your? Uh, you sound like me when I was. You kept making me say Stephen, my boy. That sound like your New Orleans. Uh, Gina Gershon. That's what we all sound like now. Uh, that's what I said. Dominique Swain as Jamie Archer. Nick Cassavetes as Dietrich. Can Kessler. I get can I get that Cassavetes again? Nick Cassavetes as Dietrich. You should Kessler. be a you should be a voice actor. Some other recognizable faces you'll see is John Carroll Lynch. I'm, you keep giving me these things that are gonna give me counsel. Why do I have the Lynch? Pounder. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's CCH. CCA and no, it's not to be confused with preparation. CCH. Call me, baby. Uh, Margaret Cho. There are some very racist names in this film. I just want to throw that out there. Thomas Jane. I love his sister, Mary. Danny, I won't be masturbating anytime soon, Masterson. And Chris. Both. Now, if you don't know this production dates, pre-production began in September of 1996, with production beginning on Halloween of that year and wrapping up upon April Fool's in 1997, which is a apropos because face off is equal parts terrifying as it is hilarious and post-production would wrap in september of 1997 thank you for moving that for me because you know you're usually late as your people are locations it now, was we, we will be remiss to say but like like i was saying it was primarily shot in los angeles among other places in california yes that was a, you want to take that budget and income i will thank you you don't, sorry, you sorry. Uh, well, don't look. I won't. I'm sorry. I just clear you do so much research. You're such a better host than I am. I just, I'm just trying to hang on by a thread here. Budget and income with an estimated budget of 80 million. Face off brought in 23 million, 387 thousand. $530, no cents, as we have no cents, clearly, as we were doing what we're doing. And it's the opening weekend now with a current worldwide gross of 246 million, nearly. Hey, King of Cock, why don't you go rock? Oh, I'm about to blow your fucking mind. All right, just you make sure. your mind blown? I'll put on the condom. Let's go. Now your mind gets blown. All right, guys, that brings us to, of course, the King of Cock Connections here. Royal, take us away. You need, more? You need any more? Hmm? You need any more? I mean. In a minute. All right. All right. Okay. What does that say? Uh, which Never mind. I shot a kid. I shot a kid. Original Ben Johnson. Caster Troy is our pal. I had an accident. I request That's elaboration. My connection to Die Hard. What happens at the very beginning of the film? I shot a kid. Oh. You know what's funny? That is a very nice segue. I would like to call this the Jordan effect. I call this the Jordan shot rules. The, uh, Michael Jordan famously uh, he famously coined this this not even term or phrase. It was an action. Hold on, what Jordan are you talking about? First of all, the only Jordan that I that you would ever recognize, Michael Chicago Bull Jordan twenty three. Proceed. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know how you feel about the. Don't even get me fucking stuff. I can't say it because I don't want people to think I'm being racist or anything. So, um. Michael Jordan himself, uh, you re remember around the time I want to be like Mike and things of that nature, he had hit a shot in a game. And once he hit that shot, he hit like nine threes in a game. And he did this thing like this. He said, look at me. He was like, so when he shot that lady at the beginning of the film and she flies out and he does the like that, I was like, oh, my God, that, it, 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 I, you're blowing my mind. But that kind of blew my mind. Did you, did you know that? That was a segue from Die Hard? 
Yeah, because you said he shot a kid. There's the shot I'm talking about. The he shot. shot. He shot her. And I mean, again, keep up with me, man. You, you got you some. Keep up with me because I'm going to bring you back to Die Hard correctly. Okay, you are in suspended animation. Okay. I'm going to attempt to bring you back to reality. Thank you. 17 minutes and 30 seconds into the film, Caster begs for his life. Okay. <laughs> Police, man, don't shoot me. And it was reminiscent, and we would be remiss to say that it it was reminiscent of Hans. Please, God, no, you're one of them, aren't you? Stop looking at my notebook. D don't kill me. Angela was right. Uh, you want to get to put that on something? Bitches calling me. In <laughs> no, bitch. I have to agree with you because that actually is one of my favorite scenes here. I'm going to go skip around in my notebook like you normally do, but I actually know where it's at because I actually prepare. I has I have here that Nick Cage does the best Alan Rickman Clay Bill Clay performance I've ever seen in my life and it it was it's straight it was straight out of that. So it's funny that you got that because I actually prepared for this and you're just flying off the cuff. But clearly even when we switch places, we're in the same place. How many movies have you wrote in there? Is, it, is that a recipe for, for all right? You people. Okay, 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 okay. All right. No, it's not it. Okay. Camp Nowhere. Proceed. Troy and Archer end up in Camp Nowhere. The name of the prison is Erewhon Prison. You are now the property of Erewhon Prison. An anagram for nowhere. A citizen of nowhere. Um, um, when I and let me blow your mind a little bit more because Camp Nowhere starred one Christopher Lloyd who went back to the future. And this film was originally supposed to be take, taking place in the future. But John Woo, yes, mama. You can't get under control. I feel like we're in the Matrix. So this film was supposed to take place in the future, but John Woo made the decision to bring it back to the present. Hmm. Like now, there's a flip side of that coin, as you would say, because what I oh, I was watching that, and I cannot listen. All I know is this: this wouldn't be the first time Sylvester Stallone would be accused of uh, taking a story and making it his own, the Beyond Bleeder with Rocky, and with this. I I don't know if you've ever seen the film Escape Plan, but. When Nicolas Cage, or should I say John Travolta, escapes from the prison, he he goes up and finds out it's like a moving ship slash oil tanker. It looked just like the same escape from the movie Escape Plan when him and Arnold Schwarzenegger are leaving. It was just like... Nicolas Cage was in the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, Nicolas Cage was in Face Off with this. And follow me here. I mean... I'm trying. Well, try harder. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, I call this connection. This is what I like to call One Take Tony, baby. One take, Tony. Please go. The, the plane. They they had to do that in one shot, one take, with like 17 cameras shooting it. There's a film we reviewed earlier this uh, in one of our seasons. What what film was that? Very upstate of you, sir. That is my connection, Tenet. Oh. Which also <laughs> had to destroy a real plane in one single take. As smart as I am, I still do not know what happened in Tenet. As you or me, I don't know what happened in Tenet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Good program, man. All right. Here's one that I, I didn't want to do this one because it goes against everything I believe in, but uh, Archer's wife is named. Do you know Archer's wife name in the film? The son at the end. What is his name? The replacement son, as I like to call him. I'm going to say. It goes, up against, it goes against everything I stand for. I'll help you out because you don't do that much research, but you're a hell of a guy. Adam. This is um, Adam. Adam and Eve. We just did a film that had a good reference to... Uh, Adam and Eve? Yeah. What yeah. was it? Being there. And now you're here. I am here. It's and I'm real. And I am real. All right, let me see here. I know I got a few more. You're having a lot of fun over there. Oh, I'm, I'm you're having a lot I'm of fun it. over there. I'm, I'm going to go home and screw your wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Angela. I'm not coming home to screw you. It'll be home. Okay, okay. 
Super Mario Brothers. This is what I, what I have here is the boots worn by the prisoners are the same boots worn by the Goombas in Super Mario Brothers. For real, for real. And in, they, in the uh, in the props. Right, and it's in it, and and while that, that's why I, I, it freaks me out sometimes that you accuse me of looking in your notebook because this goes back to what I said with the movie Escape Plan. If you notice that prison from the from Face Off is like how they've monitored people, monitor the prisoners. It's like I promise you, Sylvester Stallone was sitting home one night, like nobody's gonna think that I ripped off from this, and clearly, Sly is Sly. That's all I'll say. Bye, okay, bye. you keep saying Sly. I don't know where you're going with that. Escape Plan. You've never seen the movie Escape Plan. Oh, you're, you know what? I have seen Escape Plan. Because I mentioned it about 10 minutes ago. Yep. Is it is it connecting now? No, actually, I had not seen it. I had it on DVD, but I never watched it. That sounds about it's right. one of those films that, you know, the grandmother <laughs> buys you for Christmas. Well, I know I know you have a few more, so I just want to say this one, and I'll let you still be the king of cock. Um, I call it Danny. Oh, Danny. Life imitating art or art imitating life. I hope not. When I saw Danny Masterson uh, attempting to take advantage of that girl and the stories that have come out about him, I really hope that it's not true. These are one of those connections I wouldn't be proud of, and I really hope it's not true. But if it is, it's just really weird. Do you have that too? Because I didn't look in your book. Yeah. Okay. Why are you? Why? Why are your notes in different colors, different fonts, and on different pages? Because it's a spectrum. There's no color. Yeah, I know. I have that shit. You're not gonna take this. All right, fuck it, man. But you know I have it in here somewhere. Yeah. Right? Oh. The fact that you have your parentheses written like that is scaring me right now. I think you look in my notebooks when you're at your house. You and your daughter. Okay. All right. Yeah, but it, it, it's in there. It's in there. Well, I while you're looking for that one, I do have one that's I you you blew my mind earlier. Allow me to return the favor and give you a reach around because I know that you don't have this one. I'm gonna just say I'll I'm gonna do a. Uh, uh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say word association, or just I'll say a few words. Swordfish, speedboat, face off. What's that John mean? Travolta is the. He is the cat. But but what am I? Where am I going with that? You're an astute person. Help me out. Face face off. No speedboat. No no, speedboat, swordfish, face off. Make believe. The sphere. No. Well, the sphere, I would say. I've uh, noticed at the end of uh, the movie, which it came out later, but the, the movie, Swordfish, at the end, him and Halle Berry leave in a speedboat in a disguise he's not himself. And at the end of this film, in Face Off, he leaves in a red speedboat, not himself trying to get away. He's getting trying to get away twice. So what I have here is that Travolta loves trying to get away in speedboats in other people in other people's faces at the two a minute and two hour and three minute mark he kills a guy and drives away in a red speedboat while being chased at the end of swordfish he drives away in another face with holly berry so that happens both times he pretends to be someone else leaving away trying to escape in a speedboat and when they fly off the speedboat and face off they're both impersonating somebody else so he's a guy playing a guy playing a guy I bet, you I bet you didn't think i could connect this to jurassic park I, you're gonna blow my mind if you connect this to jurassic park oh when Duval is attacked by the prison guards, he jumps behind the box. And if you notice, what's on that box is a little logo for a company that you may recognize called InGen. Now I see why we do this show together, because I would have never been able to see oh, that. Don't, don't let your mind get blown yet, because I still got four more. To, I call this one Ass Face Kickoff. You've done your research, sir. Caster gives Archer's daughter a balisong knife. Mm -hmm. Balisong. Nicolas Cage played another character in a film called Kick-Ass, who he has a daughter. He gives his daughter a gift. Two gifts, actually. Two balisong knives. Oh, man. I, I can see that happen. I can see that. I mean, I, I don't have any more. Clearly, you, that's oh, why you're I, the king. Oh, oh, okay. Then let, let me handle this. Let me, let me take this. You got it, brother. <laughs> All right. I hope that didn't offend you. Punisher? Oh, and hold on now. You you do realize you you always find a way to go Marvel. So don't try to try to tame your tame your enthusiasm here. Curb it. Okay. In Face Off, John's son is killed. In Punisher, John kills the whole family. So you got John Travolta. Stay with me now. John Travolta in Face Off is a, is a government agent who his son is killed. Thomas Jane in the Punisher is a uh, government agent, FBI, I believe, 
his whole family is killed by John Travolta. It's almost like John Travolta is getting revenge from what happened to him in Face Off. He's going and killing the Punisher with story. Mark Wahlberg. The Punisher with Thomas Jane. Where John Travolta is the villain. And I'll take it a few steps further. John, as caster, when John Travolta is playing Nicolas Cage, essentially, it's real dicey. It really does. He talks about good versus evil, saints and sinners. Saint and sinner. You may remember that was the name of his club in The Punisher. Man, you, hey, you, hey, that's actually a good one. But what, they are not good ones? I'm, just, I'm not saying they're not. I mean, but out of all the ones that you've done, I mean. Well, hold your horses there, buddy old pal, because Peggy Sue got married. It, Face Off served as a beautiful reunion of Nicolas Cage and one Joan Allen. Do tell. Joan Allen and Nicolas Cage were the sweethearts of Peggy Sue Got Married, one of Nicolas Cage's first films. They return as husband and wife, in a sense, in uh -huh. Face Off. Well, I have one. Now that you bring that up, you actually just made me think of something else. Well, this is like a, a reality versus the Matrix connection here. There's a line in the movie where John Travolta says, uh, if that happens, I'll get the Fourth Amendment tattooed on my ass. And if you notice about a few years later after that, he actually got accused of having men massage his ass. But it wasn't the Fourth Amendment he was supposed to worry about. At that time, it was another crime happening. Well, there's a flip side to that coin. There was a, well, he asked, you know what? There's a flip side to that body. There you go. <laughs> I got one more connection for you. You really got into this character today, didn't you? Beige Volvo. No, I didn't say Volvo. That's what they used to call me in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Very astute, sir. Thank Very you. Very astute. Nicholas Cage has, has a thing for the beige Volvo. In the Rock... 1996, Nicolas Cage drives a beige Volvo. I drive a Volvo. 97, Con Air, Cameron Poe drops Pinball's dead body on a beige Volvo. And mm -hmm. in 1997's Face Off, after escaping prison, steals a beige Volvo to escape. And those are my motherfucking connections. I you are so connected right now. I see why you're the king. Uh, you're, more the than, you're, more, you're more connected than a Starbucks Wi-Fi on a Tuesday night. I'll be, I'll be editing that into another royalism. Top 10 facts about Face Off. I have 12. For number 10, casting calls. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone were originally in mind for the leads. John Woo was instrumental in the decision for it to be John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. It is as hard to imagine Arnold doing Stallone as it is Stallone doing Arnold. But if you also notice here, when we were doing the connection thing, I just mentioned this, and that's what, what made it crazy to me as I did the research, was that I've talked to you about the movie Escape Plan, which stars who? Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. That's an expendable fact that you need to know. See what I, I did there? I don't think Arnold Schwarzenegger was in Escape Plan. He was. And when I go back and edit this, you're going to be made a fool. All right. Now, what you may not have also known is that others considered for our train caster were... Harrison Ford and Michael Douglas, who actually signed on as a producer, Bruce Willis and Alex Baldwin, Al Pacino and Bobby De Niro, Jean-Claude Van Damme or JCVD and- Wait a minute, hold on. Did you just say Al Pacino and Robert De Niro? I did. Because that's the flip side of that coin. What's the flip side? I just wanted to say that. Oh, I'm taking my lines. Uh, right, I'll, I don't take lines. Okay, never mind. JCVD and Steven Seagal, Denzel and Wesley Snipes, Patrick Swayze was also considered for one of the leads. Whether they're just going to let Patrick play himself, they couldn't find anybody to play Patrick. Yeah, no, no one can play the opposite of Swayze. Hey, you're right about that. You That's crazy. Don't get lazy on Swayze. Hey, you won't. Now, John Woo chose Gina Gershon, who you mentioned earlier with your new Nolan's accent, based on her performance in Bound. Chow Yun Fat was originally Come back rumored. Again. Chow Yun Fat was originally. Come back again. Chow Yun. Chow Yun Fat was originally rumored to have the role that ultimately went to Margaret Cho. Now, Joan Allen, no relation to Tim Allen, was John Woo's first choice for Eve, against the studio's wishes to go with someone younger. Now, what you may not have known is that Mark Wahlberg turned down the role for Alex Troy. And what you did not know, because I said it earlier, is that Mark Wahlberg also played a version of the Punisher. Now, Juliana... Please. Margulies. Well... I'm glad you know. That means you actually read the notes. Thank you. Uh, Juliana Margulies turned down the role of Sasha Hassler due to the schedule conflicting with her commitments to er, ER. Jennifer Tilly was also considered for the role of Sasha. Oh, she was hot. Ah, uh, listen. 
187, Murder, Death, Kill, That's How I Feel. That was one of your best lines ever. Demolition Man director Marco Brambilla was originally signed on to direct the film. What do you think the sea shells were all about? I still do not know to this day because there's no comfortable way. It's like, oh, you know what? I call it uh, that nasty shit that people that eat at parties. Number nine, don't uncage Cage's rage. Nicholas Cage's birthday fell on a production day. John Woo let him get all pumped up for a scene and then surprised him with a birthday cake. Afterwards, Cage asked Woo not to do that again, as if his birthday would come around again during the production. For Woo's birthday, Nicholas Cage gave him a Dirty Harry poster signed by Clint Eastwood, a hero of Woo's. Nicholas Cage didn't want to see the show where the D is. <laughs> Keep seeing dick, boy. You, you get get together, Royal. Nicholas Cage didn't want to see the grotesque face makeup, so John Woo hit all the reflective surfaces on set. Bra, fucking bra. You have some numbers in here. Clearly, they're longitude and latitude. He also said that the like, <laughs> like <laughs> He also said that the lifelike dummies shit me. He also said that the lifelike dummies made of him for the transplant scene were terrifying to look at it. They made a clone of me, which is terrifying to look at. You could trip out on it. It breathes and it twitches its face, and it's, it's amazing. The yeah. only lifelike dummy I like to see in myself is the mirror. There you go. <laughs> Number eight, Slash the Slash. The studio insisted that John Woo take the slash out of the title, but he chose to keep it in out of fear that people might think it was a hockey movie. Why the hell would someone think that? All right. Number seven, stunts. Most of the movie stunts were done without the use of special effects. Well, clearly. According to Barry M. Osborne, most of the challenging action scenes were intended to be green screen, but were ultimately filmed practically, which they shouldn't have been, to support the realism. That's funny. Now, something else you might not have heard is that speaking of realism, some of the <laughs> You can't even do it, can you? <laughs> you're good, you're doing good, man. Listen, I'm, I'm impressed over here. <laughs> What? I mean, what's going on? Because I just realized that you go into the, the preamble statement before like, something else that you may not have heard is speaking of realism. Hey, I, I, I'm in care. I'm real. I'm, I'm method acting over here. Some of the prisoners are actual ex-convicts recruited by John Woo. And the prison was a little too real, if you might say, for many people catching the flu during the production due to its dirty conditions. Hmm. Dirty conditions. All right. Number six, in the blood. Archer and Caster's blood types are symbolic for who their characters are. Archer is type O negative, the universal donor, reflecting his role as being selfless. Caster is A, B positive, the universal recipient. Someone who takes from society without giving anything back. That's true. Thank you. I mean, I, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I'm black. I know. You're red. I'm left wing. Sound facts. Uh, this was composer John Powell's first movie. John Powell's first movie. He is a student of Hans Zimmer. John Woo was adamant about including Somewhere Over the Rainbow in the film. When the studio declined to fork out the money for the licensing, John Woo went out of his own pocket for it, eventually to be reimbursed after the box office success of the film. Little bonus connection, it is Olivia Newton-John's rendition of Over the Rainbow, and she, of course, sang in another movie with John Travolta. When I saw that, when I wrote that, I knew it had to be something because as we did our rewatch, and I was just like, you know what? So, you're sometimes you're here film a score in the background, but it wasn't in the background. It, it screamed, "I paid for this myself." It is like blaring. Dude, why don't you save it for later? Then shave it for later, Gator. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening right now, but I like it. All right. Shave it for later, Gator. Gina Gershon, in my royal voice here, told John Woo that she wanted to shave her head, non-American history X style, for the role. He didn't like that idea. Nick Casavante surprised Woo with a shaved head. He loved it. Number three, anniversary. The production happened exactly 20 years after the film that put John Travolta on the map, Saturday Night Fever, and in the same studio. I wonder what movie took him off the map. Number two, face slash 
because they made him take out of the title off again, not a hockey movie. Talks of a sequel were happening as late as October 2021 with co-writer try to fuck me up there. I, sometimes I just write really fast at night. My fingers are moving fast. And I'm smoking a lot of cigarettes and drinking coffee. Well, actually I'm taking coffee and drinking chocolate milk while putting that line to bed. Um, Simon Barrett stating that Face Off 2 is still moving forward with him and director Adam Winworth <laughs> currently in the latest rewrite of the script and they are really excited about the direction that they're taking but clearly <laughs> I don't hear any actors attached to it. They're moving ahead. Some oh, Matrix yeah. thing like yeah. the studio's going to do it without us. Let's go, go, man. You're doing good, man. Number one, I want to see that movie. To prepare for the roles of each other, Nicolas Cage and John Travolta spent two weeks together before production began to learn how to play each other, deciding on specific gestures and vocal cadences for each character that could be mimicked. And I want to see that movie. Those are the top 10 facts about Face Off. Not 12, not 8, 10. The, the only interesting thing about that would be is if they did do a sequel to the movie, it would be that both of them survive but they just they you know how like you in too deep you go like undercover but you don't want to come from under like they both want to be each other now like they enjoy playing the role so much that 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 john travolta wants to be castor troy now and castor troy wants to be if, sean archer if the movie were released today i think that it would be they would have they would have uh put out a uh companion reality series that that documented John Travolta and Nicolas Cage's time together, and that would have been the best documentary. Well, I'll just say this: that's the that Face Off is the second verse, ver, best version of someone I've seen playing someone else. Because what we're doing right now, they only spent two weeks together. We've been doing this for almost 15, 16 years here, so they can't do us. We're real. <laughs> Now, my theory was this. We always do Hear Me Out, and if you've never seen our program, Hear Me Out is where we give um, sometimes obscure theories and sometimes theories that are more on the serious side. Well, on the obscure side is when Mr. Royal over here said that Joe Clark fucked all those kids, which I still don't believe, but I mean, hey, whatever. He fucked them kids. And that bitch, too. Watch your mouth, man. I'm just saying it was his baby. I hope your mom's in live chat watching this now, because you got to get it together. Might have hey, been Thelma. this. Might have been his baby. Uh, but yeah, my thing was this, but more on the serious side, no one can tell you what it's like to lose a child. And in the movie John Q, and I believe me and you talked about that before, Denzel has a line where he says, I won't bear my son, my son will bear me. Matter of fact, can you say it? It might sound better coming from you. <clears throat> You're right. What's the line? Apropos. I'm not bearing my son, my son's going to bury me. I'm not burying my son. My son's burying me. It kind of went a little clear and Eastwood get off my lawn with it, but that is the line there. I like that. So when he says that, to me, that lets you know that unless you've had a child and lost a child, you don't know what it's like to lose a child. So we can't judge anyone for how far they're willing to go to get somebody. He didn't lose his child in a car accident or on a Ferris wheel or anything like that. Someone literally sniped his son through his chest. Like you're talking about like literally piercing someone's heart. Losing your child at a playground, that's a sub connection as well, because that actually happens to the Punisher. He's at the park with his kids at the playground when his kids get uh, killed. So that was another loose connection there as well. Um, it's just that that is what drove him. And it means to my theory is that a parent will go to, there's no level to what a parent can do once they lose a child like that. And that's what drove him to literally, like, what's the most obscure thing you could say? Hey, I, I'm gonna, if someone took my child, I'd be willing to cut my face off and put another person's face on to me to make sure I paid them what they, their, what they deserve. So that that's my theory on that. Hear me out on that. I hear you. Okay. Someone now, tells me you have a lot more coming. Oh, I, I do. And I'll be honest. I uh, thought that I wrote it down in here, but I don't. I, I, it's okay. I don't need it. I don't need it. Watch this. It's, okay. You don't want to sip your, your drink there? I'll get it. Okay. I'll get it. All right. Thanks for letting me smoke in the studio today. I know you don't normally allow it, but it's a one time thing, brother. It's a one time thing. Okay, so my theory is and this is a theory that I that I that I had that I that I did not just come up with. You are really committing today. <laughs> you are really committing. I gotta give you this. You're committing. The kid gets shot on the merry go round. Pow pow. I shot a kid. A merry-go-round goes round and round. It's cyclical in nature. It means that something is coming back for revenge. So there's that. But the revenge is where the theory comes into play because 
How does Nicolas Cage, or I guess I should say John Travolta, John Travolta's face when Nicolas Cage dies, how does Caster Troy die? Caster Troy doesn't die. Not at that moment, and Caster Troy doesn't die. Okay, what is the blow that, that takes out Caster Troy? It was a spear, some type of shark spear. What you know. killed Jesus? Well, depending on which version of the Bible you're reading. It was a spear in his side. To uh, uh, Jesus and Caster Troy. I'm sorry, you know, I don't, I, I don't. Uh, Okay. Weird I, I, didn't out, I, I didn't expect you to know. I didn't expect you to know that. Okay. But let me let me take you to Sunday school real quick. Take to church. Father Crime Time is in the building. <sighs> Communion has commenced. Okay. Eat that, Jesus. Caster Troy comes out as a priest in the beginning, and he dies as Jesus at the end. It Can was I a premonition. Can I do this one time, please? Yeah. Please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get to that. We'll get we to will. That. that goes without saying, but that's my theory. Yeah, that's my theory. Oh, that's pretty. No, that's, that's pretty good, man. I like. That. I didn't. I didn't think about that. Now, one thing I want you to go back when you're home tonight. Don't do a rewatch. Just do a rewatch of that opening scene. Because what freaks me out is that I never. I've only seen Face Off probably like four or five times, and I, number five was the rewatch when we did this. No, normally, when there's a shooting, first off, a father and son are never. When there's a merry-go-round, there are never only two people on the merry-go-round. There should have been way more kids on that merry-go-round. There's is a true. kid, yeah, and, yeah. but but no, there's a kid that's still standing there. When 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 John Travolta is hu hugging his son, there is a kid that is still standing on the merry-go-round that's there. So I had some. I was gonna go. It was a weird theory that as soon as his son got shot, he had I'd already like in the movie Ghost or something. He was standing there. Go back and look at that because I'm like, wait a minute. If, if there is a person getting shot, people should be running, going crazy. There shows a kid. I think, it, I know it's a kid there, just standing there. You don't see his face. All you see is his knees and his legs. I'm like, even a child, when they hear a bunch of gunshots, they're going to run. So it's like, that's very so weird. He, he, he was a necromancer. Yeah, well, Al Pal. You want, want me to go or you me? You, uh, you, 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 talk, you talk, you take it first. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I have here... Pollux always freaked me out way more than Caster as the villain of the film. I concur. And I I wanted Pollux is the sweetest death because he is such a little fucker. Like yeah. such a bitch. When he's walking out of the prison, he's like when Nicolas Cage uh, or or John Yeah, he's like, I'm I'm going home or whatever. Bye pro. Fuck you, man. He is such a little prick. When he fell through that glass and died at the end, oh yeah. I mean, they, to me, they were to me they were the. And what I'll do is, I mean, you're doing so good. I'm just gonna rift off you. Everything you say, I'm gonna just tell you how I feel about it because I do agree with you. He was the more diabolical one. He was the one that you like. He built the bomb. Correct. And I also thought a loose connection was that his strings were always untied, and his brother tied them for him because there was always no loose strings. And you notice what what his, what his brother did after he died. He tied, tied his shoe. shoe. He tied his shoe string. He, he's, even in death, he was still tying up the loose string. Which, which I, I feel like that was just one of those moments where John Travolta was like, "Oh, I got an idea here, John. Blue. I got an idea here." Oh, like he did in the People versus O.J. Simpson. He was like, "I'm gonna go try on the glove." Yeah, this is gonna <laughs> be some serious, dramatic, Oscar-worthy development. But, but I did like it. Yeah, I, it I, I did like it. It's, you know what? That was just as overly done. If that's the case, he was also the one that's like, hey, "My scar." I yeah. want that scar. It's the same way. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a. I'm gonna start doing that shit. <laughs> that was a, Jesus, man. Uh, oh, wow, I can't say that. Okay, in 24 minutes, nearly 25 minutes into the film, we get the ultimate in mansplaining. Explain. I will. I will mansplain. Hollis is merely offering a vague preface for like what is happening as far as like when she's when she says you know we're gonna we're gonna take your face and put it on his face and vice versa and of course i have no idea what you're talking about archer has no idea what the fuck she's talking about because she just merely offered a big preface to oh, don't what worry, she's about to because explain. that doctor walked in out of oh, nowhere like i got it oh yeah i, I, can, I, I can explain let me try malcolm walsh it's like bitch she <laughs> was about to do that she was setting herself up, and then you came in and just stole but, the but, ball. But if, in fairness, he identified that he is a daughter. You're going to let somebody explain you. He was probably like, this bitch is fucking this off. She's from the five. Because he probably well, tried to explain it to her before, and like, she's going to mess it up again. 
But, did, but, but what kills me about that, and I'm not, it's not one of my scenes, so I'm just going to talk about it because you brought it what we were talking about talking about. What kills me about it is he was like, so you mean to tell me I got a lot of everybody I love. I got to go back and do this. About it. I'll do it. Like, yeah. You don't need any more time to think about that, John? Yeah. yeah. John Boy? Oh, and they set it up perfectly. They, they, it, this was like the the worst nightmare scenario, and all the chips were put in place for it to play out. Like the fact that this is a black ops operation, that like nobody can know what we're doing here. Strictly off the books. Only the people in this room know, and then sure enough, they all fucking die. <sighs> for nobody to know, Cast Destroyed people found that place pretty quick, and the doctor. They found a lot of stuff. Yeah, they found videotape. Yeah. They found everything. Like yeah. you, you, by no one. Okay, I got you. Yes, you. yes good job, sir. Thank you. See. Thank you. Yeah, and that actually, right there. The worst case of stolen identity. <laughs> it doesn't get. The man stole your. The man kills your son, steals your face, fucks your wife. I mean, what else do you want? You know what that reminds me of the campaign when Will Ferrell was like. I'm going to fuck his wife. You can, Cam, you can't do that. Yeah. I'm going to, you, you you buy my son ice cream, you give him to call you dad, I fuck your wife. I'm going to fuck his wife, and I'm going to put it on television. <laughs> Hold on here, well, I got something else here. What? You have a lot of colors. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to offend you. Okay. What's that BB? Being black? What the fuck is going on in your <laughs> notebook? Don't, don't look at it. Don't worry about it. It's for me to know. All right. Uh, um, okay, three, okay, archers, sure, sure. count it down, count it down, you should have gave me your oh, ring, okay, I keep seeing dick, thank you, Jesus, yes, but apparently Eve was not seeing dick, Eve doesn't notice dick at all, because you could change, I'm gonna stop the, you, I'm gonna stop you right there, stop me, it's face off, not body off. I don't care because <laughs> she was she she fucked Sean Archer. Oh, no, I get what you're saying. Their, their dicks were different. They I do get what you yeah yeah because their she face was off. Yeah, a dick a dick difference. She knew. She had the. She knew. Oh yeah, she, she, she knew. She was trying to get some strange, and then not, and that's not why like, she was so so upset when she was like, "Don't tell me this." Like I, I've lived with him as a uh, as 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 his uh, as his wife for a week. Can I get one more week? Can I? Yeah. That's why she was so upset. Like you couldn't wait till two weeks to escape. Oh, that 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 actually that that's a good segue. So uh, this is what I wrote here: the wife is fucked, literally. literally. Yeah, she lost her son. She gets fucked by the guy who killed her son. She makes out with her husband as the guy who killed her son. She watches her husband uh, share an intimate moment with Gershon. That like how she's just sitting there in the cut, like like. Like a third wheel. No, she felt guilty. She was like, I lay, I laid on top awkward. of his dick. She awkward. laid on, she laid on top of his dick, and Gershon is laying on top of his chest. What was, which one you? Yeah, want? but there, it wasn't about the physicality. Oh, of it. it was about the fact that she's what his wife is watching him share this extremely intimate moment, and you could tell he felt the awkwardness. He was like, because she's like, no, we don't take care of our son. And he's like, he's like, yeah, okay, bitch, yeah, okay, <laughs> like. Yeah, get to fucking die already. Get this moment over with. My wife is right there. Uh, and then his wife, after that, she go, runs outside to see the man who killed her son again, lick her daughter's face. Peaches. As her husband. So she's watching her husband this movie lick is... her daughter's face, which, by the way, the fucking... The, 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 when, he, when, <laughs> when Sean Archer, uh, when Nicolas Cage as Sean Archer, when Caster Troy walks in as John Travolta and sees his daughter for the first time, he's like, ooh, the plot thickens. That, that was is so awkward. <laughs> yeah, to watch, but. Daddy's got a brand new bag. Mommy and daddy. Oh! Yeah, oh, oh there, I'm was not some, gonna, there was some incestual so, shit. Here's the thing. I'll tell you this. Out of all the films we've done, this is the hardest film to write notes for because I have notes that has a person's name by it, but I don't know that. The, the brother and sister are fucking. The dad wants to fuck the daughter. I, I tried to look up. Is that some type of Russian or some type of other thing to where certain? No. Okay, so I, I, I can expand on that a Please. little bit. Gina Gershon said she made that decision for the character in real time because she believed that there was some deep seated love between the brother and the sister. There's that, nowhere that, that is in the script. Oh, yeah. She was like, wow. The, yeah, the script, screen readers like, 
The only other time we've seen that, we have to go all the way back to season one. And I, because I edited the show, I'm going to go back and find the scene. And remember we were interviewing someone and they were like, what we, you had asked the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I had asked the, uh, one of the writers, like what, what made that actor do that? He was like, I don't know. He came up to me and told me, this is what I'm doing. I see the character doing this. Um, the, it was, uh, Mike O'Connell from, uh, from, uh, Living, uh, Way. Living Way. Yeah. yeah. He, he comes out and he goes, Hey Mike, I've decided the brother drinks and he pulls out a flask and he just takes a sip and i was like oh my god the guy's drink he knows i'm like the producer of the movie it was that was a weird it was it came out of nowhere and, and was gone just as quickly it was as like when i saw it but i was like that didn't just happen but yeah i need a little bit more about this if you're i mean if you're gonna do it do it and then he looks at castor Troy. i thought we had some good times didn't we brother yeah. hey man we had some good times, didn't we? But, yeah, we did. But more importantly, what the fuck was that? But here's the thing. I, I can't say that even if she did make that decision to do it, that's what they played up on it because you saw, you saw him. He didn't have, he meant to shoot him. Like, like Castor Troy asked John Travolta meant to shoot him. He had a choice of shooting Castor Troy or he had a choice of shooting him. He shot him. And I want to know this. What kind of bullet was that? I didn't know, like, like ten, he's did there talking to him for oh, two yeah. minutes. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was it. That that bullet wound was as convenient as talk the about box. bullet time. That's different bullet time. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, you got a lot of notes. Or, or a lot of big words. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. The uh, the picture of of uh, Archer's son. Kids today. Let me explain something to you, kids. Easy the boy. Gravity, easy boy. Easy boy. The gravity of a picture being destroyed means nothing to you little dipshits. Because now, the pic a picture can't be destroyed. It's on the cloud as soon as you take it. So you don't understand when John Travolta crumples up that picture That's it. of the dead son. That's it. There's no other copy of that picture anywhere. That's it. It's gone. That's it. it I mean, and and, that, and and again, it that still feeds on how weird this movie was because a little Catholic boy, we're not even going to get into that, walks up to him, some man told me to give you this. Like, yeah. this is the worst time to ever say that right now. This is the wrong religion to be saying that. You need to be in some... Funny you should be here because some man told to me to give you this. <laughs> We're getting canceled. All right. I just want to mention in two hours and eight Let's Take it easy on that blue film. moon, man. Take it easy on that blue moon because you were... <laughs> This isn't even the talking point. I just want the audience to appreciate this as much as we did when we watched it. We're just going to put a freeze frame up of the stunt doubles that are flying off of the speedboat right now. Well, they're technical aren't stunt doubles. They're stunt men because they're not doubling anyone. Yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> Definitely yeah, so not doing they, that. They, they, they couldn't use the face off technology oh, on the doubles. Agreed. Where's Tenet um, when you need it? My last discussion point is the end of the film naturally. All right. Well, here we go. It was a sweet moment. It it was pulling on all of the uh, the heartstrings. Tug tugging away. But what the fuck? It was so. Oh, you, you, but, you, like I'm I'm home, honey. Right. Well, few things. The the wife is a is a doctor. Was she not around for any of his post op treatment? Like this is some big reveal that he's coming in now. Number one, that's that. Number two, he shows up, and then he's got this kid like waiting right off to the side just waiting there the kid that's he clearly has a how, ta how tall was that window because he clearly walks by you see he it like he pulls him over he's like hey he's gonna he needs a place to stay i hope that's okay what the fuck is the wife gonna say at that point no like he's really putting her in quite the position. it wasn't enough time for her to process it because it, that could have went the other way. It's just like, we're not replacing our son with another son. And I was yeah, just like, she didn't that, even have a chance that, to process any of that. That's what your wife said when, when, uh, cause you know, she was watching it with me. Okay. <laughs> what? Hey, you can't, you we'll can't. talk about that off cam. Yeah. So she says that might be traumatic for the wife to yeah. have a boy just roaming around the house. That looks almost exactly looks like, and then her name's Eve. Yeah, he's Adam. Like, yeah. You can't just. Your your boy had a specific personality. You can't just replace him with a lookalike. You can't Correct. face off your child. Yeah, and that's is yes, yes, complete. Yeah. And the the fucked up thing about the ending is that John Woo had a better ending that he shot and was going to play. Really. But the studios uh, fought against it. The original ending was going to be a little bit a little bit more ominous. Set it up a little bit easier for a sequel if they wanted to go that route. It was going to show John Travolta walk in, 
he's like uh, hugging his wife. He looks in the mirror and he sees Caster Troy in the mirror uh, to like you know like oh shit maybe the operation didn't happen maybe that's he some really Freddy st- Cougar type stuff. Like uh, the one thing I did think about it that no- most people didn't notice about this was that if you notice they they didn't foreshadow it but they did it early in the movie when uh and when his, his daughter his daughter his, he walks in and he sees his daughter and she wouldn't show her face and then he turns around and he was like well baby sweetheart you, you're changing your face every day you're changing your look every day so it was kind of they're setting yeah. the seeds for it. Hey, no, I do- the, the ending was very reminiscent. Of uh, of playing trains and automobiles in a weird way. Go for it. The husband coming home, the wife looking at him long fully, the the long cuts of the uh, lustful stares, and then the embrace and the the cheesy music. It was all. I will tell you this. There will be a sequel, and I hope me and you get to write it because I'm I'm gonna write it from the perspective of that kid because he's gonna have a fucked up life. <laughs> We're coming into the segment that we like to call, formerly known as, we had to get him. He got us the FCC on it, so it's no longer Cum Swap. We're, this is casting call to where oh, we... no, see, don't do that to me, because it is Cum Swap today. Today, it has to be Cum Swap. All right, take because it away. we are doing two actors that will be swapping with each other, so it doesn't get any more swap. Take it away. Come than this. Take it away, Royal. Okay, I, I would like you to go first. I can definitely do that. For me, I ask myself which characters that I would I want to see swap with each other to try to see how they would be able to really mimic each other and play off each other and really see and it and it was really hard for me because I wanted to at first you do you want to do a duo who always do, does films together but then I say I can't do that because of the fact that you never see Travolta and Nicolas Cage do films together um what I went with on this because again I didn't want to just choose people who would work good together I want to see two people have to be very that are very different from each other try to make this happen and I wanted to see Tom Cruise and I wanted to see our friend here we we're just talking about him earlier uh, the pirate John Depp. I wanted to see Depp go Cruise and I want to see Cruise go Depp because to me, I, I really thought that that would be something because now I'm not saying Depp can't be cool, but Depp doesn't want to be cool. Depp wants to be main. He wants to be he's more he's more he's more so of a refined Nicolas Cage. He doesn't go as crazy, but he's more. And then Tom Cruise always has to be so suave. And now he has to be Deppy. Okay. I, I, he would have had to play into that Scientology role a little harder there. So I would have wanted to see them do that. And that's what I. But here's the thing. I took it one step further. I would have wanted to see them do it as teenagers. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then younger in their career, like, like play, if they were playing teenagers or something, like, it's just like... They're so now you're acting like me. You always want to seem a little bit younger. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, as Chris, me or as me or you. Chris Farley. <laughs> uh, uh, young Sheldon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but those, those, those are my two. What do you think about that? It's kind of hard. Young Johnny Depp, young Tom. I mean, just the, remove the young. Just just them in general, like playing that character, like like switching. Like Depp trying to play Cruz and Cruz trying to play Depp. I, because here's the thing. This is what I do love about the film, and I know we're, we haven't gotten there yet. They actually, Nicolas Cage and John Travolta actually made this work. Let's just kill each other. That's what I will say. I'll give you that. They made it work. So, yeah. so yes. I would have liked to see if they, and I, I, if they made this movie at the same time as the original was made. These two at the height of their career, uh, great action film stars in their own right. Each of them, Spawn and Michael J. White. They're very good, sir. Thank you. I, I know my, black my people. favorite film, of course. I know my black people. Bone. I know my black people. Spawn and. Blade, mm. Wesley Snipes and Michael Jai White. You two, two great action film stars. I, I don't know why I wasn't able, able to think outside the box on that. I mean, I, I mean, I know I don't see color, but but I I do see them as really good actors. Uh, but th- that is what's funny is originally the studio wanted I think it was Wesley Snipes and Denzel Washington or Denzel, but but at some point they were wanting to pin one of them with Nicolas Cage. And John Woo had to be the voice of reason to be like, I don't think that's going to work. No. On multiple Did they not ways. see here, here on our evil scene or evil? Yeah. <laughs> that to the music. Stop. Sorry, I, we're getting canceled. I should not be. Well, I, you can't do that. It's not six yet. But I identify as a black man. Not today, sir. All right. All right. Is that is that all you got? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I didn't think the audience wanted to see who Gina Gershon was going to be. I mean, <laughs> no. Because I, I only had one character for her. 
Sasha. All right, guys, let's get into our favorite scenes here. Um, you actually brought one of them up earlier, and I really, I mean, I, honestly, this is probably, I, I've never seen, I'm not going to say I've never seen this happen before, but seriously, I literally, when when Nicolas Cage did his impersonation of Alec Ritman and Bill Clay, like, I to me, I was just like, and I again, if we had not done the rewatch, I would not have known it. I'm like, bro, you are going diehard from dropping down to the knees, the trembling of the voice, to, to, to trying to get to a seat, like, it was it Alec Rickman somewhere is like, you know what? He's smiling somewhere. Because yeah. that he he really did that. That was one of my favorite scenes of the film. Well, I think you better pull the trigger. I think my favorite scene of the whole movie is the uh Father Troy. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. When he from from when he first walks in and he does did the it? he does the old Ben Stoller from uh heavyweight say fat is fat is here, mister. I have that. I have a note there that says that was the last time anyone let Nicolas Cage improvise. It was oh, so great, but it was just like, especially with an extra. That poor girl. Because <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, she's gonna show back up later in the movie, right? <laughs> I just knew she was a plot thing. Yeah. She's nowhere else in the movie. Like, so no, she, she's just there to get she, her ass grabbed. Bitch but this is that's what makes it so weird because you expect to see her later and you don't. Like, wait a minute, he just grabbed some random chick's ass. Oh yeah, and she's yeah. with it. Yeah. All right, oh. Peter. <laughs> That was great, man. No, I, I do have that there. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I call that the dance, uh, Medusa neck type movement. It was the layer. Uh, oh, one of the shots I really loved was the shot of a bloody Castor Troy reflected through the glasses of the daughter. That was more so on the cinematographer for that shot. That was amazing. You get like a Joker feel. And clearly you can see that they they went practical with that, which I'm happy instead of going CGI because all you see is a reflection of the doctor's glasses and you see a, they clearly they smudged a, a bunch of blood on his face, but you still see the smile, like the Joker's smile on and he's smoking the cigarette. I'm just like, man, like, and then I also told myself, this is one time where you can really see what a cigarette's doing to you real time. Yeah, that was a great scene. Oh, uh, very great scene. Nicholas Cage doing his bra, 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 bra fucking uh, O. Bra fucking bra. Connection, you don't, Mr. Rest in Peace. No, here we go. Here we go. The Joker. Oh, yeah. That's what I do, man. I'm trying yeah, to be like you. Oh, yeah. Trying to be right like you. To trying to be like you, man. Trying to right be like you. Hey, right. right. you know, I'm trying. Stop. Ah. <laughs> Motherfucker said stop. <laughs> All right. In prison, uh, I'm Caster Troy. I'm Caster Troy! And that <laughs> maniacal cry that he does. I think that's all of my favorite scenes are just why Nicolas Cage goes completely unhinged because it, that that was uh, that was I, amazing. Oh, another one of my favorite scenes I I called it uh it's, it's even though it's John Travolta is it's Nicolas Cage. I said it in this kind of Trump reality because it was like he's in the movie, but I thought about him in real life. I was like the only way to get Nicolas Cage to be normal is for him to do some type of ecstasy or drugs. He's already some type of person, and it, it's like he took the drugs. He starts calming down. I'm like, wait a minute, you just didn't take a downer. Everybody else is getting fucked. Like, don't get me wrong. Part of me wanted to be at that party a little bit. They were having a lot of fun at that party, but it was like, uh, man, you're calming down. He was like, I want to take his face off. And yeah. and his homeboy was like, it's like, like, bro, you're blowing my life. Let me get it straight. He's like, all right, no more drugs for Caster. I want to take his, oh yeah, okay, I'll get that. Okay, all right, all right. Um, my last scene is though, these is from the point that John Travolta walks into the church. John Travolta played a very inner, I wouldn't say a good bad guy, but he was an interesting bad guy mm -hmm. to watch him try. Wait, you get looking. To mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. But when he walks into the church and uh, the dove comes flying in John, typical John Woo. The best scene. trained doves I've ever seen in any film in my life, by the way. Oh, those are John Woo's, John Woo's personal doves. Uh, that, that, that whole scene when, John, when he walks in and, uh, the the two women of the of the, the of the men walk in. <laughs> Wee! <laughs> what a predicament! It went it, it went from one of my favorite scenes. I, the reason I took it out because it went from one of my most favorite scenes to not at all because I thought it was overkill. Then when the cops came in behind, I'm like, all right, guys, we don't need the the I double said, double double. Crazy double. as <laughs> Tenet was, that scene breaks my mind. I'm trying so hard to wrap my hair. Okay, okay. 
Nicolas Cage is John Travolta. John Travolta is Nicolas Cage. She was with him. He was with her. But they're also together. Like, oh. It's this movie's a mind fuck, man. Yeah, it is. But exactly. yet, but yet, it's more understandable than Tenet. It's a fluffy mind. Fuck. It is it's very much so. I, I like to call it. Very much so, huh? Uh, <clears throat> Oh, one of my other favorite scenes for this is when uh, it, it's the fact that it was a very scary moment, but it was one of my favorite scenes. It's when, and this is when I feel like uh, John Travolta nailed Nicolas Cage to the nailed his at nailed his uh, charisma and his everything. It was one scene. It's when he 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 diffuses the bomb, and they're showing this all. Everybody's in the jail. They're watching it on the TV. Apparently, they have HD TV in this prison, but they're all watching it. And John Travolta comes out, and they're interviewing him. He was like, if he, if he's listening, I wouldn't mind giving him a message interception balls ours like i just felt like that was so nick cagey you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah. so that i, I think he nailed yeah, that john travolta nailed nicholas cage mm-hmm. uh, at least two or three times and uh that, that's all the scenes i have uh, there's a I, few I, bigger boats there he nails them. i just have one other scene and i thought you were gonna i thought you were gonna talk about it earlier when you said you said you said father who father john or mm-hmm. you say, but uh, for our father Caster, well, well, Troy. well, no, he's the best father ever. Ever, because I want to state this: if nobody wanted to know this, Nicholas Cage as John Travolta was a better father than John Travolta. You're kicking Danny Masters' ass. You're smoking cigs in front of the kid. You're giving her a knife, sticking it and twist it so it opens up. I'm like, he's showing his, his family more attention. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he not. He fucked his wife. He rubbed her feet. He get me. Now that's when she should have fucking knew. Because I did catch one thing in that film. When he made that candle, that candlelit thing, see, this was something that I know no one caught. He, what was on that table? Was lobster not on that table? His wife is a vegetarian, so she should have known he would not have made her lobster. John, I'm here if you need me next Maybe time. A pescatarian, though. They said vegetarian, though. He said it when he went to her, he was like, took a date out for surf and turf, not knowing she was a vegetarian. Well, I'm a libertarian, so they can do whatever they want. No, you're not. Okay, so the Did you hear side, what I just said? I did. I don't think you did. I'm trying real hard here, man. <laughs> I'm trying to you, you hear it? If you'd like to say it again, I will listen again. Again. No, I, I didn't no, listen no, the first no, time. No, no, if you heard it's cool. I did. All right. The fish. No. <laughs> he made her lobster. Yes. And, and she's, she's a vegetarian, a vegetarian. So that's when she should have known that it was not him. But she might be a pescatarian. No, some, because some pescatarian uh, No. You know, no, I don't know because they say it specifically when he comes back later. When she when she found out it was really John, he was like, "We went out on a date. You, we your your chip got tooth. We took your daughter. He fixed the wrong tooth, and I I took you to this restaurant because I didn't know you were vegetarian. So all you ate was bread." Okay, that's you got me, sir. Thank you. You got me. Thank you. Sorry. But the flip side of that coin <laughs> is. Sean, uh, just Pastor Troy as Sean Archer, Nicolas Cage as John Travolta is not the better father, not the better husband. He's, I do tell. I request elaboration. Because he kicked the boy, he kicked Masterson's ass. The rapist? Yeah, he did. Good, it, yeah, that's almost like, that's almost like to say a necessary evil or, or, or like this guy is doing a terrible thing for a terrible reason. Did he just fuck outcome. his wife or did he whine and dine her? He could have just fucked her. He whined and dined her. He talked, he read her diary and understood her, David. He's a I mean, the royal, huh? He's a sociopath. So am I. Okay. But the, he only kicked the, he only kicked that boy's ass because he wanted to fuck the daughter. He was, it was There's a not a flip side to that corner. That is what's scary because the plot thickens. <laughs> and he just and and uh, your wife astutely said during that scene when we were watching it together. You keep telling she, me about that. She says, uh, "So is is he really trying to defend the daughter, or is he just bloodthirsty right now? And is he really trying to woo the wife? Woo John Woo, shout out. Or is he just?" horny probably both I'm i would say that. he yes he i when he was a it was very cool to watch him kick masterson's ass like yeah speaking of job. watching nobody talked about that Paulus was a cuckold he loved to watch he called his brother <laughs> she's really enjoying me and you oh, <laughs> like, yeah, good, good good all right <laughs> all right Pollux. <laughs> The, uh, I wanted to I wanted to piggyback right off of when you were talking about. Do we need a, do about, we need a uh, re, we need a reset problem just to be safe? No, I don't ever need a reset. The 
Nicholas Ca- or John Travolta being great at, at doing Nicholas Cage. One of the best, one of my favorite bigger boats right here. Where at? Because you keep okay. flipping those pages over there. God damn. <laughs> at about two hours in the movie, in one of my favorite scenes when John Travolta, when they when they're doing that whole circle around everybody and what a predicament. When Sasha walks in, <laughs> the way John Travolta looks at looks at her and goes, Sasha, what the fuck? Sasha, what the fuck? <laughs> Now that was very good. I did like that, and and, and my thing like, because it, it was that's when you say when you say he's a psycho, a, a sociopath. It's like I know I haven't discussed with you that I'm not Castor Troy right now, but come on, you've been with him. You know what it's like to be with me. I shouldn't have to say anything, Sasha. So yeah, that was uh that. But I but speaking of that, that was one of those things that we didn't. I don't think we talked about. You touched on it earlier. Was that that I I when Sasha really realized that it was she found out that it wasn't Castor just by how much he cared for the son. <laughs> Michael. And even when she dies, she said, don't let him be like Caster. If you blink, that's a blinking if you miss it moment. She didn't care anymore. She knew that he was a good man. Mm-hmm. And she figured it out when he kept saying, uh, I, I forgot the kid's name, but he kept saying, Sean or something. Like, he kept saying the kid's name. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Michael. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, he, yeah, so yeah. she was like, don't, be, don't let him grow up to be like Caster. But I thought that, that was a very good point. Um, one of mine was, it was at the very beginning of the film, and I found myself at the beginning writing so much stuff down. I'm like, I forgot, this is a 90s flick. If I go on the best lines here, I'm going to be here all night. So, uh, oh, see, there was a flip side to that coin because I had the opposite problem. I, <laughs> I, I have two lines. Oh, and our, our, I guess we're not facing all because here, here mine. One of them out. So. Well, here's mine because I think we had this. This is, this is a list. This is it. Yeah, there you go. Hey, yeah, right. Hurry up! I gotta get this piss out of me. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'll start with um, when, when they first meet each other in the prison. John Travolta, as 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 our as uh, Nicholas Cage says, uh, it's like looking in a mirror, but not. It's like looking in a mirror, only not. And I thought that was so sweet because they do the little. The, the spin around and it's just yeah, like that yeah. was very done. I really like that one. What's your other one? If I were to let you suck. If I were to let you suck my tongue, would you be grateful? At first, that seemed really weird, but you know when it got really weird for me? When I realized when, she was an FBI agent and no, she wasn't really him? When really? it got really weird to me was when he stuck his tongue out. And she proceeded to actually. That suck wasn't it. weird for me because oh, you know, weird. I mean, I mean, I'm. You're, you are letting well, a you're not human th- man beast stick his whole fleshy tongue into your female bitch mouth. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> We're gonna get canceled. <laughs> Again, you're not there when me and Angela are home, so you don't know what we do. But what I will say is this: is that it, it as as okay. Let's call it kind of weird. It becomes really weird when I find out she's an of the cover FBI agent. Like, how far are these agents willing to go to get their man? Like, okay, I, I see. You're like, like wait a minute, now like, hold on, like, no, nah, this is not in the job description. This is. Because she was, that is weird. Yeah, I was so, I was so, so perplexed by just the fact, the words that were coming out of his mouth and the tongue that was going into her mouth that I forgot about the actual dynamics of the situation. Like, yeah, that's very. Uh, so. And then she gets shot later. Like, nah, keep her around, bro. She's she's down for the cause. This is a combination of lines. Yeah, well, I, with that being said, <laughs> how about my dick? <laughs> Here we go. And uh, you, you're really getting the character today. Uh, the, this, my last one was, it was a combination and it was really at the beginning because it, I really liked it. It was uh, John Travolta, as John Travolta was saying, as, as uh, Sean Archer saying, Why don't you just give me a little break, okay? We'll take a break when the case breaks. Like, it, like, uh, uh, like, let's get all the good lines out of the way early. Oh, Sean, Sean Archer was such a Debbie Downer for yeah, the first was. 20 minutes of the movie. What are you guys clapping for? Oh yeah, that's right. What is all this? <laughs> oh, hey, oh, actually, uh, wait a second. Jimson. What about to Anderson? Peters. Montgomery. <laughs> McDonald. <laughs> Pincus. Janelli. Winters. <laughs> Harry. Well, you know the only thing missing from that scene was Owen Wilson walking in and saying. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'll have <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, guys, so those were our favorite lines. Now, let's talk about some of my favorite co workers in the film Scene Stealers. He's playing me, and I'm playing him. Can't nobody do it better than us. But if you don't know where we're at, it is now time for Scene Stealers. Oh, I'm not playing. <laughs> See what I mean? See what I mean? Gosh, you're handsome, man. 
Ah, with that being said, guys, we've covered so many. <laughs> you know how to shut me up. <laughs> I'm just waiting on the laugh. There it is. I knew it was coming. Mr. Spritz is in the building. That one's for you, Ange. That one's for you. Guys, all right, we're at Scene Stillers here. And of course, if you haven't seen the show before, each season after each film we do, we cover our favorite artists that can be male, female, animal, a wooden puppet, necromancers, anything that you really like. So earlier this year, we covered Joker and it was Joaquin Phoenix. Don't tell the joke if you can't make the croak. I like that royal. <laughs> all right, the invention of lying with Jennifer Gardner. You can guard in my garden anytime, bitch. Howard the Duck, Chip Zine. Sugar Man Jeffrey. Candyman, Yaya Abdul Mateen II. Yaya. The People Under the Stairs, BQA Brandon Quentin Adams. Shout out, Brandon. The Ghostbusters trilogy, minus the one with the females, Harold Ramis. Die Hard, Mr. Nicholas, I'm sorry, Alan Rickman. Rest in peace, sir. The Matrix Quadrilogy, Neil Patrick Harris, and the original Lawrence Fishburne. Yes, sir. And the French Dispatch with Jeffrey Wright. Being there, Mr. Rest in Peace, Peter Sellers. And we just did Studio 666, but we haven't actually done it yet in real time because you can't cheat by the crime time. So we'll just put up right there or there or there. He'll put it up. I mean, it's just freaking me out that we do studio. We did six six six, and we're dressed like a this this this. this my fucking okay. Hey, you gotta you gotta you know. do it. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. So what we're gonna do here is a hey, uh, first off, you got any honorable mentions? I do. Go. Uh, you sure? How many do you have? Eight. I'm sure. Uh, I got three. <laughs> okay. But I'm gonna do two. Uh, sounds about right. Sounds about white. I don't have an honorable mention. Actually, well, I, okay. I do. Nicholas Cage is my honorable mention. No, John Travolta is my honorable mention. John Travolta, you're my honorable mention. <laughs> uh, <wee! laughs> what a predicament. David Polanski as Mr. Royal is my honorable mention. And another honorable mention for me was, uh, was Lazaro. The face. I, I really like what he did with that character. Lazaro. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the incest brother. Hey, man. We had some good times, didn't we? You can tell that he's Caster Troy's friend and clearly uh, means a lot to his sister. But my point being is, is because at first I tried to tie in, well, maybe maybe he had to pretend. Because remember, oh, Sasha said I had to tell him tell everybody it was someone else's. But they clearly make it known that they're brother and sister. But again, it, like, when him welcoming him Caster back home, and how he's like, I, I hate the cops, this, that, and the other. He's badass. He's this, that, and the other. He, like, I really thought he didn't have that much time in the film, but we meet him at the beginning. He, he's like, huh. Hey, Sean. How's your dead son? I'm like, God damn. All right, bro. Yeah. Shit. Wait, all right. God. Right, right. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's twisted. And, cause it, you know why he twisted? Because it, the hole won't close. I have a scar. <laughs> yeah, but he, he really, he really, really did good. And of course, uh, to me, uh, I, another, again, another another honorable mention for me. Again, you mentioned it is 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 John Travolta. Like, I mean, and and here's the thing. I'll be honest with you. If Nicolas Cage wasn't in this movie, I would have given it to John Travolta because mm -hmm. if he was just playing some random other guy, there's like because it's so. There's only one person that can play Nicolas Cage, and that is Nicolas Cage. I can't even do. You can't even do I, it. Yeah, I feel Nick. I feel John Travolta's pain in it right now. Like guys, I mean, really, like you, like out of all the people you could have asked me to do, you're asking me to do him too. You need 20 years to sit next to Nick. I knew it was a very bold thing to try to pull off. You know, us being each other, and we don't look exactly alike, and we don't uh, behave at all like each other. Uh, but I had an easier time of it than Nick did because Nick has a very specific style of, of uh, uh, attributes. You know, he, he has a, a talk like this, and he has a, a, a specific walk. And, you know, and, and I can... Pretty good Nick Cage, John. <laughs> that was good. It's such a crazy mashup, too, because John Travolta, they're both weirdly terrible good actors in their own right correct John Travolta is over dramatic yes Nicolas Cage is just unhinged he's just Nicolas Cage is the only adjective you can and, describe him. right but somehow they both like even though they are both on paper terrible actors like if you check off all of the qualities about their acting styles like 
this is terrible. But then you watch them and they're both like a delight to watch. And of course, you have specific experience working with him because, of course, on Lonely Hearts, which was filmed here in Jacksonville, you, if I'm not mistaken, you, I'll tell the story because you told me a million times you were on set. John walked up to you, shook your hand and said, good job. And if I'm not mistaken, the quote was, you know, thanks, I'll see you again, because you saw him as a co-worker and not as some A-list actor. Man, it was almost like you were there. I feel like I was. Man. Man. Thank you. I will say this, though. John Travolta and Nicolas Cage both being great, of the two of them, before I say that, I'll say this. You, before I say that, I'm going to, I want to, I want to, I want to, okay. Downshift, Ben Kingsley. It is to be appreciated the what both of them had to take on for the roles because not only are they playing each other, they're playing each other. John, like for instance, John Travolta is playing Nicolas Cage, uh, that and he is he's having to act like John Travolta or it gets so dicey. So you have Nicolas Cage being John Travolta, acting like he doesn't want to be John Travolta. So it's While like in plan. front of him in certain scenes. It's not like they're always off scene. They're, they're together at times. Oh, which is crazy. Only four times in the whole film do they actually face off. Correct. The, the hero and the villain. And in jail. Well, we, we know them. Boy. And the hero and the villain. That That's such an interesting dynamic because you're, you're asking the two leads to play a hero and and the villain at the same time. Mm. <laughs> uh, <wee! laughs> what a predicament! Depending on where you're at in the movie. Right. That that is quite the undertaking right. for them. Another honorable mention was Joan Allen, and it's because of what um what me and Angela were talking about last night. For her to have to put up with all that, and you thought she put up with so much in the film, but then at the end, here comes here comes Adam. Like she had to, like even her as a person had to be like, well. <laughs> How much do you want me to take? I just fucked yeah, this yeah. other guy. You're back. You're cheesing. You left the kid outside. Then you bring him in. And it's like, he's a replacement kid. Uh -huh. Like, like so, so her having to go through all those. And that's the thing. Really, I, to be honest with you, she does. You know, I take that back. She, no, I can't take it back. I, I'm going to tie her. I'm going to tie her and John Travolta as my top honorable mentions. Because now that I'm thinking about it, she had to deal with Nick. Cage. She had to be with Nick. Cage, deal with Nick Cage as, as John Travolta. She had to deal with John Travolta. She had to deal with John Travolta as Nick Cage. She had to do her losing her son, her daughter changing her face every day, and Adam. So I'm, uh, she almost got the damn scene stealer. Shit. Yeah. Uh, I would say between John Travolta and Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage is my scene stealer. Mm -hmm. He is he is the better actor of the two. And in this could, film or in overall? I would say overall, he's definitely got more Oscars. I would I think. Uh, more Academy Awards, whatever they are, but he is just specifically in this movie, he was better at playing the flip side to that coin. Well, if you're Sean Archer, I guess I'm Caster Troy. The overall performance, Nicolas Cage was, had a more nuanced take on on the uh the the character traits of john travolta and it was more believable to me like when nicholas cage is is playing sean archer stuck in the prison mm -hmm. you could really feel that torment inside of him that he was after stuck. after the original scene because he went full on nick cage when he got there oh, with, yeah. the, with the fight we, Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but after that, like you say, when his brother's leaving and doing that weird shit, like you can really see, like he really had to get out he, of there. Really he hurt me. Nailed him. that, John Travolta. Yeah. Like, what, what, what's happening? <laughs> so yeah, I agree with you, man. My scene still, of course, is Nick Cage because I'm glad of, we didn't have to face off about that. No, no, no. I didn't think we were going to have to. And I had this been something, had it been another film, possibly so. But this film, I, I will give it to Nicolas Cage because you're right. You say, I, it, and don't get me wrong, they both did nail it. That's the thing. I don't think a lot of actors could have nailed it. Mm -hmm. So they were both clearly capable of doing it, which does show their range. It's just simply that Nick Cage, like you said, he nailed more the nuances, and he he was able to more downshift than. Then of course that uh, Sean Archer or John Travolta was able to upshift, and because it's not an upshift with Nicolas Cage, it's a diagonal. It's this, it's that. It's so many things that cannot, it, it can't be recreated. Like your royalism, the full spectrum. He is the full spectrum, and while John is great at what he, but put it this way, Nicolas Cage couldn't do what what John Travolta did in Saturday Night Fever. 
So I'm saying, so they both are. Yeah, there's, not, side of that going. there's not. Have you ever seen Nick Cage dance? I want to. I don't. So with that being said, no, I got to give it to Nick Cage. And I'll be honest with you, like I say, and I didn't think it is. I told, we talked about this the other day. We're three seasons in almost done with season three. And we've not done one single film that uh, had either one of these actors, yeah, which is the craziest very thing very in the world. To avoid too. So, so yes. And so, right. And so with that being said, Nicholas Cage, welcome. Get your ass on up there, brother. Hey, I told you get that bunny. I was going to add that in post. You didn't have to. All right. With roughly 20 writing credits between them, we are thrilled to talk to the award-winning writing duo behind Face Off, Michael Colleri and Mike Werb. Thank you very much for being here, guys. Thank, thank you for having us. us. Yeah, thank you. This question is for, for the both of you, and either one of you can take it first. Now, according to our research, because we do our research, uh, the first credit that you guys share together is in 1996 is Dark Man 3. Die, Dark Man, die. How did you guys and me and begin working together? So in 1990, this was uh, just to, you know, your listeners may be interested. This was the golden age of the million dollar spec sale and by spec screenplay sale. So Shane Black and all these guys who are now, well, not all of them, he's mostly the only one, um, got their <laughs> career started by selling spec screenplays for, they would get in these auctions among the studios and they'd sell for a million dollars. And so there were a bunch of these happening and Mike and I were like, well, we want some of that and uh, we can write an action movies. And so we got- they were, they were mostly action, almost, except for like, uh, except for John Matson's Milk Money. Milk Money, and yeah. The size and shape of breasts may vary from person to person. Uh, Why Women Talk that Diane wrote, uh, it oh, was yeah. mostly yeah. action. I know, like the, the last Boy Scout came out of that, that deal with like Shane Black and stuff. And- uh, was originally going to be called Die Hard. <laughs> yep. Yep. Although, yes. Yeah. Wild time. And there were a bunch more that were never made, which is why that phenomenon ended. <laughs> but anyway, so we thought, well, let's try to let's try to manufacture something that we can sell that's very commercial. And so we got together. And now it's that again at that time, what people wanted, the studios wanted desperately was the next Die Hard. That was sort of the organizing principle of action movies. What's the next mm -hmm. Die Hard? And so we got together and and um, well, and keep in mind, we had been we had known each other for five or six or seven years at this point, and yeah. we spent a lot of time uh, noting each other to death about our own individual work, and so we were pretty familiar with critiquing each other, and we had a lot of respect for uh, not just for the work we had done as individuals and the feedback we got from each other, because it was super important to us essentially. And there were uh, one or two other people who were in like uh, writer's rooms with us after we left UCLA, we wanted to keep that going where we would you know, organize uh, weekly meetings at like a mall in Century City or somewhere, we'd all meet. And every week we'd give each other assignments, which kept us honest because, well, we'll get into the advice for, for your uh, the uh, your audience uh, members who are either writers or want to want to be screen or TV writers about mm -hmm. how that works, but basically we uh, you know we were keeping each other honest and focused. And so anyway, go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly right. We we sort of skipped over a little bit part before we started writing. We had known each other for some time. We'd met in film school at UCLA. As Mike said, and we we met because I was taking two sleeping on someone's couch and taking two buses from North Hollywood to get to UCLA, and it was very uncomfortable. And I'd often be late, or the bus would be late, or whatever. And uh, we we had this one class, and somebody said, "Oh, you know, I was complaining about you know again ru rushing in late because of the bus schedule." And somebody said, "Oh, that guy lives in Toluca Lake. Aren't you in North Hollywood?" I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, you should hit him up for rides. And, and he so did. I, I did. He did. And uh, that's and, how we met. Yeah. And that's how really we got to be got to be friends. And so um, anyway, so flash forward a few years and we've been helping kind of trying to help each other make our way. I got my first agent because Mike 
introduced me to his agent and um, et cetera. So that's generally the way it works. So anyway, so we got together and it was really a extra talk about an exercise, an exercise in manufacturing something that that was going to be commercial, which is not usually which I don't advise <laughs> beginning writers to do at all. Uh, but we thought, well, maybe we can maybe we can find some. It's it, it went a little deeper than that. I mean, it, we, yes, there was a mercenary aspect to it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the fact that neither of us had any money and I certainly was swimming at that point in forty thousand dollars of student debt. Um, I did have my own apartment at that point, um, thanks to uh, student loans that I saw and paid off. But the the fact is, we both really enjoyed those movies. Yes, yes. And we both were interested in writing aside from the spec sale market uh, of something. And we'd spent a lot of time going to those movies together when they opened. And so we're like, you know, it felt it was very organic for us to try and write one together. Yeah, we when mm-hmm. like when die. I, I can tell you exactly when, die, when Mike talked about uh, um, Raiders earlier. I went to see Die Hard on opening night here in, at the Avco Theater in Westwood, and I sat through it like three more times. Uh, I was it's, so blown away by that film. I mean, it was it, it's and still probably you know, the, if not the greatest action script of all time. The movie is great also, but from a writing point of view and a construction point of view, it's flawless. And so, yes, we were definitely much, very much, uh, what would the word be? Um, you know, well-inspired um, um, and uh, energized by what mm-hmm. could be done in this, in, in that genre, which we, we, you know, thought like, well, let's, let's do ours. So anyway, so we got together and talked about, well, what would ours look like? And the first, I'll jump over a lot, but the first, Thing we talked about. Will, this will circle back to die, dark man, die, by the way. Yes, it will, by the way. <laughs> oh, I, I trust I trust your ability to, to form a to form a story. So so because what face off was written first. Yeah, face off was written first. Oh, wow. oh, that's right, because it was written in like 1990, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you know that. Okay. okay. Nin- yeah, 1990. And this so so the first so we talked first about, well, should it be die hard in a one of the many die hards ideas we had was die hard in a prison. And I had done a bunch of research about Attica, the Attica riots from the 70s. And we talked about, you know, does a guy go undercover into a prison and then he gets caught up in a riot and, you know, he has to defend himself. And it's like a real horror kind of movie situation. And and then, Mike, you know, we kicked that around for a while. And then Mike said, well, not that long. Attica (laughs) is, Attica is, yeah, it's all took place over a long weekend. So it was pretty drunk. <laughs> so um, Mike said, well, Attic is kind of depressing, which it was. He goes, what about a prison in the future? And then when he mm-hmm. said that, it was like, oh, the mind, you know, the, it, it mm-hmm. just hit a groove instantly. And so then we started figuring out how to, how to what we would do. We, we thought, well, OK, well, we want a good guy. Bruce Willis type goes into this prison. And why does he go in and what's it for? And he's going to get caught up in this you know, kind of like we knew right away we what we wanted to do was have him be uh, a persona non grata, right? So he we the audience knows he's a good guy, but everyone else thinks he's a, a bad guy and he's caught up in this nightmare where he can't, no one knows who he is and he has to fight for his life. And that was really the impetus that got got us into face face off. But I don't know. I, that, I mean it was after we we had also gone to a revival house of which, you know, Quentin Tarantino's New Beverly Cinema aside here in LA are unfortunately a really dying breed. Mm-hmm. They uh, uh, We went to Pasadena, I think it was, to see White Heat, which we'd seen before, both of us. But I love that movie. And it was really uh, Cagney's, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Cagney's uh, uh, swan song of playing a gangster. And there's a sequence in that. If you guys have seen White Heat, and if you haven't, please do. It's amazing. There's a sequence where uh, somebody has to go undercover in prison to uh, get some information out of Cagney, who's been arrested at this point, and he's incarcerated. And uh, and uh, and there's somebody who can make him make the F- make the undercover agent there. And so uh, it's it's full of tension. It's really 
really an exciting sequence. And that was, Michael, wasn't that in, somewhat inspiring yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, by all means it was. In fact, we, yes, White Heat was definitely an influence in that regard. Not seconds, by the way. Neither of it <laughs> had seen seconds uh, until well after uh, the, yeah. the face-off was uh, shot and wrapped and, and uh, you know. Okay, so that, yeah, I did see that. That's a uh, urban cinematic urban legend. So we wrote the script in second half of 1990, the first draft of Face Off. We went out to the market in early 1991, which is a whole other story. And we- Back up, back up. We, we, once we figured out what the idea, which is one thing, one thing that we were struggling with was the, the, the antagonist for the movie. We had, we had settled pretty much on the hero and all that, but we were seeing all these movies that were coming out that weren't as good as Die Hard and didn't have a Hans Gruber and and uh, you know one, doing one arm push ups naked in a hotel room and threatening to conquer the world and we're like, why can't the bad guy be as interesting as the good guy? Mm -hmm. And then you know that was the light bulb moment when we both said, why can't the bad guy be the good guy? We once we had that going on, and Michael filled this in in better way than I I am doing right now. But uh, we we started scene carding um, out our our plot line and our character arcs, and uh, we did that in what two days? Yeah, yeah, pretty we fast. Had, we had the story. I mean, yes, the first draft is very different in in some ways than the movie you, you guys are familiar with, but. But the the actual uh, a spine, the blueprint of the movie remained completely intact. Yeah, through, for, through yeah. the whole journey. It'd be, it'd be, we, we always looked at it as the it's a wonderful life of action films because everything that you see in the first third or first half of the movie has resonance and pays off uh, in either macro or micro ways. Uh, as we uh, move toward the ending. That's one of the things that I really love about Face Off is that it's almost like you're getting two feature films in that where the plots have uh, the resolution. Um, the first, like the first half of the movie is like a prison break plot. And then the second half, it, it, yeah, like you said, it's that payoff of all the, uh, the emotional turmoil and, and tension that's set up in the first half. Like, when you have uh, Nicolas Cage living, knowing like knowing how terrible of a person he is and how unpredictable, and you're stuck in prison, and uh, and that man is is sleeping with your wife and no, taking care I of your you, child, you're wrong. I said he, they're right. They did the exact right thing. Nicolas Cage was a better husband than John Travolta. He was a better dad. I love that we're calling and him Nicolas Cage, even though it was John Travolta. <laughs> it's Nick. It was Nick. Okay. No, I'm talking about Castor very, Troy. Very, when Castor, Castor Troy, Troy was yes. home with John Travolta's wife, he was a better husband, a better dad. He, yeah. he beat up. He beat up Danny Masterson. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it, great it, job, guys. It had, it had fantastic <laughs> pacing, though. Danny uh, Masterson. But, but, but that was a con. I mean, again, that was a light bulb moment that when we hit upon. Well, let's have the good guy, and the bad guy, switch places. And again, Mike, right. Mike really said, "Hey, uh, yes, and they're better in each other's lives than the other." And then that, that's when it real. That's we basically could start writing after that. That once we did that, we we had. Once we, knew, we did what, Mike? I missed once, that. Once you said that that you, you don't remember, but they're better in each other's lives. Once oh, we get in, mm -hmm. then we knew exactly what every we could write endlessly and did on this movie. But we always knew what the scenes, how the scenes would be sort of emotionally organized. That that was always going to be shot through all the scenes, and it still is. And that's the way it is in the movie too. To this. You know, still, I think that's what makes a good action film is when you have that emotional grounding, when you can, you know, when when the characters are emotionally grounded, the situation is uh, challenging your emotions. It gets you invested in a certain way where the action is just kind of like icing on the cake. Yeah, well, that's why one of the big, huge issues we had with studios and directors previous to John Woo was uh, the stakes. I mean, 
you know, one of the previous directors insisted that the bomb be about to go off at the climax of the movie. And Michael and I were like, really had to put our foot down. It's like, it's not about blue wire, red wire. The stakes are over the family. And uh, it was, it, we had to fight really, unfortunately, John Woo completely understood that because it's just boring to have another bomb go off. It, mm-hmm. it, it, and, not go off fact, and and that, that's <laughs> right the bomb doesn't go off because the bad guy has bigger ideas than just killing people in the original draft he was recruited to be a vice presidential candidate is it true that you got the uh and we're gonna get into some imdb trivia facts here because they they let us down a good portion of the times so we want to set the record straight on some things that are directly pertinent to you guys but I guess a good place to start is since we're talking about the inception of the idea for the movie and everything, uh, Mike, is it, is it true that uh, a friend that was in a hand gliding accident had surgery, had something to do with the, uh, uh, the <laughs> idea for the, you tell them, Mike, you tell them, you tell them the story about the hand gliding accident. No, you tell them. <laughs> no, somebody still has an issue. We can't so, talk about it anymore. <laughs> so the short answer is yes and no. What, what basically when we started writing it in 1990, 91, it, and it went out around town and so forth, and we, we did manage to set it up. There was a lot of pushback, understandably, about facial facial swaps, facial surgery, and people were like, "This doesn't exist." It, you know, it's crazy, and it and it is. But neither did fucking dinosaurs coming back to life. But here we are with Jurassic Park, one of the highest grossing films of all time. We're going to limit right. our movies well, to exactly. things that only and I, exist. I, I think yep. the story can now be told in its entirety, which is Mike invented this tale of the hang gliding accident as a go-to <laughs> anecdote when people, executives expressed out mike said well i know a guy who was in a hang gliding accident and had his face taken off and put back on and uh and he looks you know he doesn't look perfect but he looks you know close enough and i i think i got that right mike please correct me if i got that wrong um but i can argue with what you just said yeah okay so there you go um he's not gonna argue which he would if i got it wrong so yeah so that was a created um sort of, you know, kind of anecdote to make this thing seem less implausible. Now, the interesting thing was it took so long for Face Off to be made. It really did happen to someone, though. Oh, it did. Oh, OK, okay. so okay. My, my memory was that it, it, it was kind of in, in, invented. But anyway, by the time it got made, it, it, it wasn't that far fetched uh, technology. And within a couple of years of the movie coming out, they were doing facial transplants. So. And we had to do several interviews with plastic surgery magazines. But um, the, 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 the real thing is, Michael and I made a vague initial attempt to pitch the story before we wrote it to our agents, and we were basically laughed out of the room. Yeah. That it's Let ridiculous, down. don't write that, come up with something that people will understand that makes sense. And But we were so passionate about it. We knew what we were doing. We thought, we have to get this on paper or else nobody's going to get it. So we sat down and wrote. I, I, I'm going to close up on on Die Dark Man Die. Uh, oh, good. So anyway, so we wrote the script. We sold the script. It went into kind of development phase and then development hell. But in the meantime, our agents were sending it. The, the script made the rounds in town. And one day we got a call that Sam Rainey's company wanted to meet with us. Sam wanted to meet with us. Um, and again, this is sort of a similar thing to the Alfred Hitchcock. Universal was like, hey, Darkman made some money, but let's make some, let, you know, let's try to just mine, yeah, the, mine the title for direct to DVD. Yeah, we want to make more. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, without doing the big theatrical release, is there money mm-hmm. to be made in these home videos, direct to home video? That was a sort of maverick idea in 1991 mm-hmm. to do original stuff direct for home. And so... <laughs> We went and met with Sam Raimi and and he had read the script and he basically just said, oh, you guys are hired. Yeah, I mean, this was like, was this the only time that ever happened? We went in, we were like, obviously thrilled to meet with Sam Raimi, who was prepping Quick and the Dead at the moment, which is an underrated film. And uh, and he's we started to sort of pitch some ideas and he goes, oh, I trust you guys. 
um, you're hired if you want to do it. Uh, we'll just have the everyone figure out the contracts. And we we drove off the universe a lot. We were like, wow, that's <laughs> it's that so nice. Nice. <laughs> we yeah, that's right. awesome. So, so so we did write uh, uh, Die Dark and Die, as you can now tell, came after was was actually we were hired on the basis of Face Off. It just got produced first. It's That's kind cool. of the same movie anyway. <laughs> and I had a question. If one, either one of you can take this, and I, I must know, we didn't have a chance to ask this before because we didn't know we we're going to be talking to the writers. Which one of you writ, writ down that Castro Troy should look, lick John Travolta's daughter's side of her face in that film? That big tongue lick on the side of that young girl's face. She looks so frightened at the end of that film. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, my understanding was that was Nick uh, uh, kind of in... John. in Sort of embodying the character. I don't. That was. I don't know if that was in the script, but it might have been. Hold on, guys. Hold on, John. I'm feeling something here. You know what? I take that back. In the script, I think he sticks his tongue in her ear. Oh Oh, yeah. So he he dialed it back. He stuck his tongue in her ear, but Nick changed it to licking her, licking her. Because that's much more acceptable. There we go. Things become a lot more real once casting is done. (laughs) Right, because I had Milo licking Jim Carrey's ear. When he's dreaming of Cameron Diaz in the mask. Uh, yeah. See? So we might as well steal from ourselves, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. See, I, yeah. See, we would have never got there. See? Boom. All right. We're going to launch into a few um, a few of those trivia facts for IMDb. And, and these are, feel free to just do true or false if you want to elaborate or have a, have a particular story that, that one of these bring up. Feel free. The first, uh, the first fact is fact john travolta asked the writers if they were making fun of him with the ridiculous chin line and they explained that that caster was such a narcissist that he would hate having anyone else's face true nice that scene was about to be shot and we were summoned to uh jt's trailer to discuss that line our response was john look you are (laughs) without question, one of the most famously handsome men on earth. The audience knows that. But inside, you're not John Travolta with the famous cleft chin and all that. You are Caster Troy. And Caster Troy, as you guys just said, is an excessive narcissist and believes he is the best looking person on earth. And so this face does not suit him. And so when you say that line, we're pretty sure the audience is going to be laughing with you and not at you. Right. And and Michael, what did John say after we pitched that to him? Yeah, you know, he 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 got it. He, you know, I, I mean, I think he got well, I think he knew what we were, he certainly knew what we were going for, but he wasn't a hundred percent sure. Oh, well, that, come that's, on, that's, that's Ch- right. chin up, buddy. Yeah. Chin up. <laughs> well, right. Chin up. <laughs> All right, so the second one here, true or false, the scene with Adam listening to Over the Rainbow on his uh, headphones was John Woo's idea and not part of the original script. True or false? Uh, that's true. That's totally true. Yeah, okay. John originally wanted uh, one little tiny sidebar on this. The, what John wanted to use was Puff the Magic Dragon. Uh. And, um, and apparently uh, the producer came down grumbling one day, shaking his head in disbelief because... He, he said the Peter, Paul and or Mary, whoever controlled the rights to it, wouldn't wouldn't license the rights because he still believed that that he could get a movie made of the song one right. day, even though the, <laughs> even though it was 30 years old. And who knows? Maybe he will. But they were very right. put out by that. And then they couldn't get the Judy Garland version either. So yeah, the Judy Garland estate would not license it for this. Uh, violent movie. I guess they must have sent the script or something. Well, it's, uh, it's serendipitous Newton-John. to have Olivia Newton John singing yeah. on a jo- another John Travolta film. It's, yeah, uh, I know. We we love that circle. imagery too. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was good, but that's true. Yeah, right. R- writers in symmetry. It's like uh, uh, if anything gets a writer off, it's symmetry. It's it's nice, like you know, circling yeah. back and. Yeah. Yeah. The studio wanted John Woo to take the slash out of the title, but he kept it in because he didn't want people to think it was a hockey movie. Is that mine, Michael? Yes, that's yours. Take it away. (laughs) I thought so. Okay. So when we came up with the idea that that would be the name of the film and we simultaneously to that put the slash in, we were 
always terrified that they were going to take the slash out, which was always a problem for us because it just seemed weird. And the whole concept was so weird. So Mm -hmm. we went behind the scenes uh, while we were in prep for like a fucking year, I guess. Uh, And we went to, you know, because we were now working on doing rewrites on the lot. We had our own trailer. We went to the production designer, the cinematographer, the costume department, publicity. And we just, because a couple times, a few times memos had come out and the slash wasn't in there. It was either a hyphen or just two words. And sometimes with the word off, not even capitalized. So, um, so we went to every department and we complained quietly to all of them, insisting that the slash be put in because we wanted to inoculate everyone to the idea. We wanted Mm -hmm. everyone to get used to it. Well, then came time that uh, we were shooting. It was a six month shoot and we were shooting the movie and there were um, there were uh, rumblings from the head heads of the uh, studio that it, we couldn't do it, that the wow. slash was confusing, that uh, marquees, uh, movie marquees. Uh, this is before, I guess, Nip Tuck and Crazy Beautiful and whatever. Yeah. Um, that, that didn't exist. They couldn't put it sideways. So uh, I did you was it I was not there. No, this was you solo. I was summoned into a meeting where it was me against like 10 people at Paramount asking me to defend this slash. By the way, there's an article in Entertainment Weekly, things we learned this summer. And that slash, I think, is in there uh, as an article. But uh, yeah, so I was summoned in there. Michael, for some reason, couldn't be there. And I went on and on about metaphors and Joseph Campbell and and how the it's it's sort of a uh, it's it's yin yang and it's it's the slash is separating like a dagger separating good and evil et cetera et cetera et cetera. I wasn't winning anybody over, and then finally <laughs> I just like put my hands up in the air and said, "Look, without that slash, people are going to think this is a hockey movie." That's all it took. Oh, we could lose money. We could lose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, now you're true. talking their language. And then, of course, there was the whole issue during production where we heard rumblings that the studio wanted to change the name of the movie altogether away from Face Off into something like Doppelganger or something. Sounds and like it wasn't forward. just for the German market. Good. We, again, went behind the scenes while we were shooting the loft action sequence. Is that right, Michael? Yeah, yeah. This, yeah take, this was... Mike, Michael, you take over on this. Well, well, uh, Michael, I'll have to jump in if I forget something. So it, as it just by coincidence, we got to start hearing the rumblings that they were wanted to change the title. And we were on the set and um, they were shooting all that stuff. And so, of course, all the all the actors were there. And somehow it came up in front of Nicolas Cage that no, we they, went to him. Oh, we went to okay. There you go. That that explains it. That they were wanted to change the title. And <laughs> Nick, Nicolas Cage said, and this is on the set, like they're about to shoot. And Nicolas Cage said, Don't worry. After this, after tonight, we didn't know what he was talking about because after tonight, they won't be able to change the title. And we were like, uh, okay. And he goes on, and sh- that was the night he shot that scene where he's on drugs with Nick Cassavetes. I'd like to take his his face. Oh. I wish there those footage still existed because that went on for, for like, like ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. Camera rolling. John Rue just loved it and just let them go at it. Face off. Face off. Face off. My face off. Your face off. I mean, they just had a blast riffing on all of that. And of course, only a little tiny part of it remains in the movie. But once he did that, that was it. They just they just committed to it. We never heard it again. <laughs> it's always fun for writers to bury, you know, s- kind of bury the title into your dialogue. Um, yeah. I, I finally watched Nightmare Alley last night and they do it very quietly. Um, but uh, I mean, it's buried in a longish speech. Yeah. If, if you could sneak in a good roll credits moment, that that's always fun. Yeah, we, we had a right up there uh, Nick I, Cage I'm just sure it, Mike. it was in your face <laughs> I'm yeah. just the whole in, my in, this, I just... in the script he only says it like once mm-hmm. and then they kind of think he's weird and they sort of move on but Nick just made a big meal out of it 
Nick has why, do this why, happening? why do I see this happening this way? They go up to Nicolas Cage. They, he found out that they were going to change the name. He's like, oh, yeah? That, watch this. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gave him that motivation so that that's pretty, that's pretty dope, guys. Now, let me ask you this. There has been some jokes online about I even said it in our review of the film, which you guys haven't seen yet. Mike Werb joked that the bomb had the longest lag time slash latency in movie history, just long enough to keep the plot going. <laughs> I feel like that's true. <laughs> when did I joke about that? <laughs> I, I, we, we said that, but I don't remember when I said it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. I, IMDb has got your phone tapped. There. <laughs> well, that's the, to, back to the point we talked about earlier. Totally true. That we knew we needed something huge to motivate someone removing their face and getting replaced with the serial killer, the killer of your, your, uh, Son. you know, of your child. And mm-hmm. so, uh, so we knew that was important, but we also knew it was also important that the movie not be about a bomb. And so, yes, right. it, everyone's waiting for it to go off and, you know, screw you, uh, uh, people who think you can predict what's going to happen in this movie. It's not <laughs> going to go off ever. John finally got the dance. You know, he was up for that dance and scene. John was having the time of his life dismounting that bomb. He was oh, just yeah. like, <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Oh, I think he, it's in his contract. He's got to dance in every movie. Just least. for a little bit. Just Once a time. little. Once he time. does it again when he uh, first meets Janie, i.e. Jamie, his daughter. And oh, my God. He got a brand new bag. And yeah. he loved when he did that. Oh, he was. You got something I want. Actor. We were so delightful on set. Very yeah. sweet people. So they had a problem with the name of the film. They didn't have a problem with a grown man pretending to lean over to what he thought was his daughter or she thought that was her dad reaching over to a cigarette with her in her underwear. They had no problem with that. Well, yeah. another another defying expectations there because we see him fondling that chorus, that girl in the choir at the very beginning. And it's yes. the same character inside. And so you think that, but nope, we flip it. He's actually, and they, they have a bonding moment right away. Not, you know, it's, 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 horrible in that it's sort of sexually charged what you're expecting him to do no Mm -hmm. he wants a cigarette from her don't tell mom so now they have a secret and he it's part it's the first step in him being a better father uh than the distant man that she's known her whole life thank you from Uh, the writer thank you i have to say uh this is off topic from the segment ring but i just i don't want to forget it this, you guys did such an excellent job when you I, when you're talking about the son dying and wearing the face of the person that killed your son. You did such a great job of setting like a great movie relies on great stakes that are set up effectively, and you guys did such a good job with that with with just setting up this nightmare situation. Looks like you're gonna be in here for the next hundred years. <laughs> That you just long for the the good guy to escape from and make things right. Really good. The script, and, and this I think is actually you, you brought this up before. The script that's presented to John Woo was set in the future, but Woo suggested changing the setting to the present to focus on the dramatic and psychological elements of the storyline. Um, I know you guys said it was set in the future, but was that was that um, at John Woo's uh, oh, suggestion to, to bring it to yes, the present? Yes, I do. Okay, so 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 this this requires a little unpacking, a truth telling. Yeah, a little a little truth telling. <laughs> so so the, the original script that we sold again because we were so nervous about the face swap aspect of it, we wrote a movie that was very futuristic, a hundred years in the future, it had a lot of other futuristic elements that made it literally unproducible or or like the most expensive movie ever made. But we still set it up at Warner Brothers and it, it didn't really go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere at Warner Brothers. We did our drafts and they really weren't. That's another topic. But it ended up sort of like sitting there for a couple of years while the option was running out. And in those couple of years, we had a lot of time to talk about it. We had a lot of time to talk about what we would have done differently, what would be better, what would be more commercial. We just rummaged around for a while about it. And in that time, we thought, you know what? We 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 did, we overdid it. We kind of overthought this. We we really don't need. We didn't need to do be so far flung. We could have done this as a secret program. The more realist real it was, the better it was going to be. So instead of hiding the idea, we want we you know we we thought we should really just embrace it and go at it from a real personal point of view. And we'll get better actors that way anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So once we got the option back and we set it up at Paramount and we had a meeting with their producers, 
we went in and they said, this ne also never happened in our whole life. They, they were like, what do you guys want to do with this? Yeah, you know, because Warner, had Warner Brothers had repeatedly when you know, look, Joel Silver is his incredible track record producing movies. But it was basically the notes from from Silver Pictures were, you know, uh, you know, action scene, uh, glass uh, crashes right. every 10 pages. And, it, and when we met with Steve Ruther and Michael Douglas, who produced the film uh, with David Permit, the, it was literally we were like Michael just said, we were kind of blown away by uh, was Michael Douglas, I think, who said, I've read every draft. What what's tell me the story that you guys want to tell? And then he was like, we don't need all this futuristic stuff. Yeah, we said we want to get rid of all that because for so many reasons. And, and they got very excited, too, because they were like they were afraid to bring that up. Like we were going to be resistant, not that they couldn't have replaced us. But when we said the first thing we said was, look, I, we know what you bought, but we want to get rid of all that. We want to focus on the people we you know, we want to make it more intimate. And they were like, yeah, great. Go. That's what we want, too. Um, didn't, but didn't Michael Douglas say, yeah, because you know what, guys, this is a this is a psychological thriller disguised as an action movie right and he goes At, i'm a producer on this on this movie but if i'm putting my actor's hat on i'm telling you this actors get to play good and evil in the same movie when it's identical twins you guys have an opportunity to to get great actors because it's not identical twins it's something else yeah, it's something we've never seen before. And uh, this is more of an Edgar Allan Poe uh, kind of story, he said. So, so yeah. So flash right? forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So flash forward, the movie's made. John Woo makes the movie. And after the movie, we see an article from John saying uh, that he was the one who took out all the futuristic stuff, which he and we were like, huh? He never, ever saw a draft of all the futuristic stuff from our point of view, because it was all gone by the time he came on the movie. Well, we asked his partner, producing partner, Terrence Chang, who's been with him forever, and Terrence started to laugh and explained that back, we didn't, we never knew this, but back when the script was at Warner Brothers in the early 1991, Joel Silver went to Hong Kong with a stack of all his scripts, because that was the moment when Hong Kong cinema was starting to kind of get to be better known worldwide. And so Joel Silver, as Mike says, brilliant producer said, oh, I'm going to get me a great Chinese director. And he went to Hong Kong with all his scripts that were in development. And he was basically saying, John Wu, I've seen A Better Tomorrow. You can direct any of these you want. And he read Face Off. We didn't know that. John had read Face Off back before we ever met him. And it was completely futuristic. And he said, I like this but it's too futuristic. Well, we never, that never filtered down to us. You know, Joel Silver, I'm sure never even remembered. But when John got the script again in 1994, it, all that stuff was out. He was like, oh, they took my note. That's a, that, I, that's, that's funny, but that's like a perfect, uh, that, that's a perfect example of the synergy between the writers and directors. So anyway, so that explained why John, and to this day probably still takes credit for taking the futuristic stuff out of the movie. But it was, again, it was like you say, it was synchronicity. You, you guys were on the same page even before you were in the same library. Yeah, yeah. In an early draft of the script, Archer went to Castor's mother's place to hide out. The writers <laughs> wanted the mother to be played by Elizabeth Taylor or Jack Nicholson in drag. True or false? True. True. All true. Absolutely. We, those were the two actors we were very keen on on playing that role and it ended up uh there was just no room for that scene or that sequence but we really felt like it would be it ended up being turning into the loft sequence but having nowhere else to turn we thought it was and we still believe it would have been amazing to have him because the whole movie as you guys have noted several times in this conversation is about balance and counterbalance mm -hmm. And so having nowhere else to turn, having escaped Erwan prison, he hasn't, he's hunted, the most hunted man on earth. Where does he go? 
he goes to Castor's mother's house where she is a very strange person uh, who I think in one of the drafts has, has a incestuous relationship with her son. Um, but, but he spends the night in his nemesis's uh, uh, bedroom, which has oh, not yeah. changed. So yeah. It's not changed since high school, since, you know, since he lived there. And so our hero gets insight, not just in the behavior of this horrible mother, but also the totems of Castor Troy's childhood. And we learn a lot of backstory about who he was and why he became what he became. Unfortunately, it's not in the film, but you know, it helped us inform everything about him anyway. But yeah, that's that's exactly that's exactly correct. And we went through, through different versions of what the mother was like. But yeah, it did not. It unfortunately fell out of the script at a certain point. We did hear in Script Magazine, we got interviewed by like Script Magazine or something like that. And um, the person who interviewed us had recently somehow she knew Jack Nicholson or, or had a meeting with him. And she actually, she told us, Oh, I told Jack Nicholson that uh, you guys wanted him to play the mother, Travolta's mother, uh, Castro Troy's mother in drag. And he got a big kick out of it. Apparently he, he thought that was freaking hilarious. So, uh, but um, so that would have been fun. Here's a question for you guys. Can you guess what Castro Troy's mother's first name is? is or was in our script. I'm sure you can guess. One guess each. I did not know he was going to do yeah, this too. Know, now just, that's, uh, okay. Oh, did right, you right. get our memo of questions we were going to ask you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I am going to, uh, Jackie. Oh, very good. But I'll wrong. say, uh, <laughs> shit. That's, uh, that's all I had. On. I feel uh, my, my head just got All right, really I'll hot. give you a clue. <laughs> Think, continue to think Greek mythology. Medusa. No. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good guess. It is a good guess. Uh, Helen. 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 Of Troy. Helen of Troy. Oh, oh! damn it. I, damn it. I love Greek mythology. Damn it. I really like the idea that like uh, what makes a great antagonist is when you tempt the audience to uh, to feel bad for them or at least to to understand them. And I could see the I could see why scenes like that would have been. And like you said, that putting a magnifying glass on the contrast between the two. Characters. Can you imagine going in that bedroom that they were talking about having and seeing the two bunk beds from Castor and his brother? Like there's like this whole thing is taking another that that that. Guys, I wish they would have let you keep that. We need a writer's cut. Fuck a director's cut. We need writer's cut. <laughs> yeah, <movies>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, the writer cited White Heat and Seconds as influences on the plot. But I heard you earlier in the interview say that you guys didn't see Seconds to like way after this. Is is this yeah, correct or no? Yeah, that's okay. correct. Because I didn't want to dispel that rumor because sometimes people will see, see stuff and say, oh, man, they took that from that. Like, no, people have ideas all the time. So, you know, you got to put them on paper and everything. So Seconds is a great film, by the way. It's an amazing movie. But, yeah, it was not it was not on our radar at all. No. Uh, Although my father what? did run into John Frankenheimer and uh, who said he really liked the movie. <laughs> did I tell, ever tell you that, Michael? No, I don't know. What did did he, Frankenheimer like the movie? Yeah, my father had, a, ha, maybe she's still a client. My father has a, had a client who had a, a post-production house in Santa Monica. And Fra Frankenheimer was in post on one of his last movies. And he, saw, he really liked the film. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Anyway. That's cool. The, uh, the last uh, fact here is... Um, INDB states that Nicolas Cage considers Face Off to be one of his, uh, or his, actually just his favorite film that he's worked on. Provided that that is true, how does that, how would that make you guys feel to know that you penned the 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 script for Nicolas Cage's favorite film? And like of all the actors to make that statement, I feel like it's more complimentary coming from Nicolas Cage because he's made like he he's he's comparing this to like three thousand other films. Yes. This year, five thousand. Thank you. There it is. <laughs> right. The well, man is working. Well, I, I had never heard that before. Of course, I'm. I had neither. And flatter if he felt that way. I will say this: shooting the film itself, the production of the film itself, which was, as Mike said, was six months long, was very difficult. It was a very happy, harmonious set. 
Um, John, they, they, John, both John Travolta and Nicolas Cage worshipped John Woo. John Woo was, is, um, you know, he was just the rock at the center of all of this kind of like chaotic storm. The production was was very, very smooth. I mean, look, there's always money issues and stuff like that, but there was no ego around these guys. Uh, they were given latitude to create with John. They, you know, they felt included in the creation part of it. They were given freedom to do their thing. John Lo- Wu loves actors. He loved them. Um, it, it was just, it was for a movie of that size and that complexity and that much money. Um, it was, it was weirdly bereft of tension and anxiety. There was never like the studio coming down and screaming and stopping production. Mm-hmm. There was none of that. And, um, so that was, I think, very, uh, very helpful. And I think part of that reason, the main reason of that was because of course, Travolta and Cage were happy. They were happy yeah. on the set. They felt taken care of. They they felt very connected to John Woo and heard. But the other, I think, important part was there were no rewrites. There was no chaos around the script. The script, well, was other the script. than the climax, but yeah. yeah, I mean, we had to do some some changes around blo- you know production issues. We had but thirteen like- days to shoot the climax, yeah, and. Uh, we they one day they came to us and we had to cut it down to five. Wow. Yeah, so so there were challenges like that, but it wasn't like every day these guys were getting new scenes and new pages, you know, that were taking the store that they had no insight where they okay. came from. There wasn't any of that, so it was a very stable for a movie of that size. It was a very sort of stable undertaking. And since most people still didn't understand it, we were required to be on set at all times. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's is it John? Is it Cass? That, that's a perfect <laughs> that's a perfect segue, actually, because the next question is regarding the complexity of the script and all of the moving pieces. Even when we were taking the notes on it for this episode, it became challenging to kind of like like okay, this is Nicolas Cage, but it's ca- like when you're when uh, when you're writing something like this, it's so complex with with so many different parts that. How do you like what what did your process look like keeping everything in order? And I'm talking about like down to the 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 micro level of like how you how you organize the names of characters and yeah, the script so it's not good question. to the actors. Yeah, we we very decide, good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um and we and we debated how to do it. We weren't exactly sure, but what we what we landed on very fortuitously for us, as it turns out, was we whoever they were, we just called them that name. We we did regardless of what what face they were wearing. Nice. So we were of course always able to keep track of that. But if you just open, of course, the movie was shot essentially kind of kind of in and out of sequence. And you know, of course, you know, you would go to a location once. So for example, when John Travolta was being filming all the FBI office parts, he was both going to be both Caster and Archer in those scenes. But they were all shot like over the same period of time. He's in the same wardrobe. They're shooting all out of sequence in that location. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it got kind of confusing sometimes. He wouldn't necessarily know which of his people, you know, in, in... in the confusion of the daily hustle, he, he always knew, of course, what character. Yeah. But not always. Yeah. Not always. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, there were, there were a few like times when both of them were like, "Which one am I?" Yeah. yeah. Well, especially at the climax. Yeah, at the climax. You, didn't the original draft, Michael, have us say it was? You know, when you're writing your character and you're typing on Final Draft or whatever you guys use, we use. Uh, at the time, I don't know. We Word probably star. you probably wrote it in WordStar. Or WordStar, some yeah. Early software program, but it w- we we would have uh, uh, J- Sean Archer, and then a parenthetical as Caster. Yeah. God, that had to be tedious. Right. Oh yeah. It, yeah, oh. which it, it made the read really Clumbers. cumbersome, and so we took it. We took all that out. We just and we just kept the names. The only way I was able to do it was I, I called them pre-op archer, post-op archer. Like that's the only way I was able to do it. Like pre-op, post-op for the surgery. Yep. And we would maybe in description, if there was this like a tense, I, I can't say to point to a specific part, but maybe we would say, Oh, so Sasha sees Archer, but of course she's you know, she thinks it's caster. So like we might do mm. that kind of thing here and there, but not very much. We just left it the way it was. 
I wanted to ask a quick question because he's going to be too afraid to ask it. I and only because uh, Mike, you brought this up when like there was going to be a little part of this incestuous thing that happened. There you is, are stuck on the incestuous. No, he he brought it up, not me. The sister, <laughs> Sasha, and the brother. Was there anything that should have been hinted at? Something was a little different going on there. <laughs> I was totally between Gina Gershon and Nick Cassavetes. <laughs> so be it. That we'll was not it in this. That was not in the script. No. Okay. <laughs> Look, actors. The actors are doing their actors thing. They they all want to you know to command the screen, and in fact, we they had to really uh, at the climax kind of kneel, kind of like uh, put sort of uh, sit on Gina Gershon for a moment because she wanted to show up at the climax with her head shaved. Oh, yeah. She came to us. Yeah. And she was like, I want to shave my head in solidarity with my dead brother, Nick Cassavetti's character. And we're like, oh, that's a great idea. We'll run it by John Woo. But you know what he's going to say? And she's like, what? He's going to say that if you come in that room, in, into that <laughs> shot, which is the Mexican standoff, at the church, if you come in looking like that, the scene's all about you. Yeah. And she was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and John was like, John Wu was like, no, 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 no. Oh, man. No, what, what no, no, that, no. What is that like for you guys as writers? Because you kind of like, I, I imagine it's not the first time you've come uh, at uh, like toe to toe with the ego of an actor that thinks they understand the character or the story more than you do. Uh oh, here comes Mike. Mike can Mike can talk about Nick Cage. No. <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> Which story? The one at the at the climax. Remember, he he was upset. He was upset because we we were upset. I don't know if I want to get into that. Okay. That, that's okay. That's if you, want to, yeah, we're, that's we're okay not, so you don't have to. We're not here to throw we mud. Had, we, we had a very, very good. It, it is true. We had a very good relationship with Nick who ad-libbed, uh, you know, a healthy amount and all to the benefit. There was one scene where he and Alessandro Nivola ad-libbed a scene, which in our opinion uh, hurt the film because it had to do with the substitute backstory for those kids, those brothers growing up. And that was literally on a six day shoot. It was the only day both of us were not there. And we struck that set and had to move on. And so uh, uh, it caused a little bit of an issue with us and we were shooting some other scene and uh, Nick got in my face about it. And uh, uh, you know, about, what they had what they had ad libbed and it, it it's not like we came to blows but everyone was everyone was staring at us and it was very uncomfortable john travolta who doesn't like any conflict took michael cleary aside and just left the set and uh to, you know and it's ta i don't know what they talked about and i was left there with i think jerry bruckheimer was there a lot of people showed up whenever you know, in the heads of Paramount, whenever they were shooting to get scenes together, they're not in the, the they're not in the movie that often yeah, yeah, at, at, mm -hmm. at the same time. But we're they right. were that day. And so I just told Nick that, look, you know, let's have I'll go to your trailer at lunch and we'll hash it out what happened with that one sequence. And I have to say to Nick's credit, although, you know, it looked like it was going to be a, a big issue and I thought my career was going to end. Uh, I went to Nick's trailer. I explained to him why I didn't, why we didn't care for the ad lib those two guys did regarding their backstory and that how it hurt the film ultimately, because now we don't have one. And Nick, you know, I have to say, I just love him because he like, he kind of burst into tears. And if I only knew, you know, and I'm sorry. And, you know, and I, I still didn't know whether it was just crocodile tears because you know, he's an incredible actor. <laughs> but he, was, he was so gracious and kind to us. Uh, he, he really uh, was, yeah. Very generous. That, that's interesting, isn't it? When, like, because yeah, a, a good movie relies on the, the cast uh, kind of embracing the passion that the writers have when they, they create the story and then the, the cast and the crew comes involved and to, the, the movie is the, the great movies are great because everybody had that same passion and embraced it. But at the same time, it's like it, it, when that, when that passion kind of uh, expresses itself in ways like that, where, 
yeah, it's it's easy to look at it as like this this dude's just trying to run off with my story, but he's just somebody that like you created characters that are so that are so uh, dimensional that it made him care about it to the extent that he felt like he knew them too. And there there was a funny coda to that story, which was like the next oh, right. day, the ne- the next day we were on the set and uh, an executive from the studio, essentially the company, came down and we were the like same day. The same day. And, and well, Mike should tell the story because it's what happened to him. Yeah, you tell it. Okay. So the guy comes down the set and we're thinking, oh shit, we're going to get yelled at. At this point, the movie, the shoot was almost over. So we really weren't being afraid of being fired, but you never know. You never know. And the guy came up and Mike was like, oh God, I'm going to get, I'm going to get ringed out now by this guy. And he came up and said, so I heard about, uh, you know, yes, your conversation with Nick, this thing with Nick earlier. And Mike was like, yeah, yeah, it's all right. He, and the guy goes, listen, can you tell him about this note? I have to, I want to give him about something else, this other thing uh, that I, we don't, we kind of wanted to change. And Mike was like, no, 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 no. You tell him. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Because they were all impressed that Mike was actually able to go and have a conversation. You know, they're terrified. Here's the thing. And understandably, I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like I'm dissing these guys, uh, not the, the executives and stuff, because you know, every day is a is a fortune to shoot. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they don't know always what kind of state of mind the actor is going to be in. And so if they look the wrong way, like we were told at the beginning, you know, don't co- if, if you guys are having an issue with the movie or something like that, don't complain in front of Travolta. It's, it's going to make him feel insecure about the movie. And then that's bad for everybody. And so yeah. we kind of learned that it's like, be very careful around these guys because if if you somehow are the straw that broke the camel's back emotionally that day they might go in their trailer for two fucking days and not come back that never happened on face off ne- never mm-hmm. but it does happen and and that's a catastrophe for the production i mean people do get fired for that and so there there the people tend to kind of tiptoe around the sort of the, the 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 sort of big guns involved because they don't want to ever take the chance uh, of of doing anything that will slow the process. So yeah, yeah, yeah you have to be a little bit. You do have to walk on eggshells a little bit. And so they were very impressed that Mike was actually able to have a functional, uh, creative conversation with another artist on the set about the quality of the film. That 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 you know that they were blown away by that but you know i I will say this you know mike earned that by the way that's the part he's not saying being on the set every day being a resource being you know uh, complimenting nick on because nick did a lot of very important ad-libbing um that we were able to then fold into the movie later when we, we we shot scenes with travolta as the bad guy we were able to like and vice versa when he grabs the girl's ass in the beginning, as you said, later on in the movie, when he's Travolta, he grabs his secretary's ass. Well, that wasn't in the script until Nick did that on the set with the young girl. We said, oh, we got to find a place for him to do it as the other act, as the other actor. Mm-hmm. Did it. And there was tons of that shit. It was important to remind the audience constantly that they were different people, despite the fact that it was the same actor playing that role. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. So, but you know, so we did actually have a very uh, productive um, relationship. Um, and look, those guys are, you know, they were movie stars. They're movie stars now. They were movie stars then. It's yeah. intimidating. It was really mm-hmm. as as friendly as they all were, and as uh, available. And Travolta was just a riot to be around. Just he was very happy, which is not always the case. These guys are not always happy on movies, but it makes all the difference. And, but it's still intimidating as hell. I mean, you're sitting with freaking John Travolta, you know, telling yeah. him, Oh no, you, you know, you're, 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 you don't worry. Yeah. You're, you're handsome. handsome. You're handsome. You're fine. <laughs> keep telling him, keep that motivation up there. Yeah. Keep I mean, not to mention that if a, if a person that's important enough walks away from an altercation like that, feel in a certain way, it could cost you, the career. Yeah. 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 I, I want to ask you guys this. Is there anything you guys changed from the original draft that you wish you hadn't in hindsight? For me, it's just about the mother, the scene we talked about, the sequence mm-hmm. with the mother. And then I guess the scene that, uh, that got cut where Travolta spends the, where, uh, yeah. Joan Allen kicks Travolta out of 
the bedroom when she he's promised her that he's done with this. He's taking a desk job and now he's going undercover and can't tell her what it is. And then he goes into um, their child, their deceased child's bedroom and and cries. And they were like, uh, we don't nobody wants to see John Travolta cry in a movie. We're like, well, we do. And they're yeah, like, he's oh, great. It's too bad. Know. He was great in that scene. I, that might turn up in the that might be on a DVD. It is. It's on. It's a, it's a, it's in the a, the deleted scenes. Oh, it is. OK. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, that kind of time, we were... You guys wanted the next Die Hard, right? You don't remember John McClane crying to uh, Al Pal about a <laughs> hey, pal. Yeah, but you know what? You got to remember that the first twenty, the everything in the first thirty minutes of that movie is to justify this insane decision. Right, is to yeah, sell right. that decision. Everything. Oh, of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go on. No, please. I uh, was well, speaking of that to your right uh, audience of of you know some uh, whatever percentage of your audience's uh, writers. That was another thing that we had to do. It wasn't just the bomb uh, that. Could, would motivate it yes that that was fine it made sense they were going to kill a bunch of supreme court justices at the la convention center but the other thing was we had to sell the surgery and by selling the surgery we couldn't just go right into the surgery we had to have an right. earlier sequence so michael and i i think michael found something oh, yeah. uh, uh, about um the fact that they had grown an ear human ear using uh, uh cells onto the the side of a mouse right mouse and we, we we had video of that and we showed that to the studio and we said look we need one step before the big surgery Correct. and that's why in the opening sequence the fbi agent loomis gets his ear blown off and mm. then we see that and that that's the buy-in for the audience oh they don't know necessarily about the facial surgery at this point but they do know that, that this ear can be replaced. And I think, Michael, isn't there, a, I mean, you guys have seen the movie more recently probably than we have, but um, isn't there a moment where Travolta looks at Loomis and doesn't know which ear it is? Oh. It's been replaced? That was in the script, certainly. Yes, oh. yeah, because Dr. Hogue, Dr. Walsh says, you probably can't even tell which ear it is. Right. And he, and he can't, there was like one moment. I don't know if that ever made it onto screen. Oh, I don't either. And of course, it was done very differently in the movie. It was done with laser beams or whatever, which yeah. we were like, "Huh?" And the cra the crazy thing is, is that I I don't I need I, well, and I don't need I did believe it, but I didn't need to believe it to enjoy the movie. Right. Like, like I'm I'm signed on for what that what that the situation that that surgery creates. I uh, like to see John Travolta be Nicolas Cage and Nicolas Cage be John Travolta, and then the stakes with the family that's set up. Like, I, I'm willing to suspend belief. For the sake of because it's it's such a great instrument in telling such an effective story, like it's almost Shakespearean. I mean, even is the attention to detail for me when John Travolta uh, uh, goes down the street to see the house, but he goes like six houses down too far. He was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. Like it's those little <laughs> things that people like. Um, we keep hearing whispers about a possible sequel written by the VHS and ABCs of Death writer director Simon Barrett. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah. Um, what we heard was well, it was um, the there, Kong versus Godzilla director. Yeah, it was the Kong. It was the Kong versus Godzilla director who kind of made this announcement. Came out right before the movie Kong versus Godzilla came out. And by the way, that's that's a pretty common gambit in show business when. Uh, you know, a director or actor or somebody, they have a movie coming out and they're not exactly sure how it's going to do. Uh, mm -hmm. In the weeks ahead of time, they will flood the trades with how busy they are and what their next project is and how great their career is going and all that stuff. And that that's a pretty common phenomenon. And so, th so we were as surprised as anybody when that news hit and we did speak to the producer, David Permit, who didn't, you know, didn't, was, we love dearly. He's a, just a great guy. Um, so, he, but he couldn't say too much about it. Specifically, he just said, it's a great idea. The script's coming in. I really think it's going to be great. But then we never heard a single peep after. So we don't know if the script ever came in or if it didn't work or, or what, but we haven't heard a peep. But when you guys are creating a story like that, like putting a, a movie like like you create face off, you put it out there. Do you in situations like that? Is there ever like a right to first refusal or something that, for that seven you're years? Offered? Seven. OK, that's what I was wondering, because it, it's got oh man. 
Yeah, I guess seven years is enough time to be like, all right, somebody else can play with it for a little bit. Um, and, we, and we did pitch them <laughs> over the years. There would be interest from time to time in a reboot or a sequel or a television. We had a great idea for, um, for uh, uh, we, were, we wanted to turn it into a 10-episode uh, arc limited summer series. Yeah, uh, where uh, in one season we were going to have a do it with two women with a completely different plot. Another, which would have been probably the first season where uh, we because the surgery needed to change a bit, uh, where um, we cross a racial barrier. Oh, I doubt and it. We have good. we have a, a black uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who blows this uh, sort of Aryan nation brotherhood uh, cabal apart, leading to a lot, you know, sort of like a Waco kind of disaster. But a few people are surviving, including the leader's son, who's hell bent on revenge for his father. And then our hero wakes up uh, in a some sort of slimy New Orleans, I think it was, motel, uh, where he um, is wearing the face, the white face of a uh, white nationalist serial killer so, and has to try and get his own life back. Yeah, the, 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 the difference between the first movie and this movie was what Mike just told you was like what happened, but we didn't know in the, the difference is we spent so much time setting up in the first film why they needed to do the surgery. In this, he's just, this guy's just grabbed off the street, wakes up and has a different face on. And, wow. and the whole movie is him trying to figure out why, who did it and why. And he That's discovers crazy. that he's like the serial killer. They basically kidnapped him and stuck a serial killer's face on him and basically yeah. said, go try to survive. And he's also, yeah. does he has to learn all this stuff about this guy's life. Has no idea he's closeted gay, wasn't he gay? <laughs> Maybe in one version. I don't know. So don't suddenly know. So this is, so this his boyfriend this. is coming this. on to him. So this is something that you flushed out. That, you know, this is something that was like on paper that you flushed out. Yeah. yeah. Can we pitch this to Paramount TV? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That's crazy. That that's that, amazing. That's we pitched a few mind. versions. We pitched a few versions. And the ironic thing was like after the movie came out and made a ton of money, we they said, hey, could you guys have any ideas for a sequel? All, all the studio did the whole time the movie was being made was complain how much money they were paying Travolta and Cage, how they had gotten completely ripped off. And they did. They paid them a shit ton of money. It was worth every dime, but mm -hmm. they they complained about it. And so when, when the movie came out, we had a meeting and they said, do you have any ideas for a sequel? We said, well, yeah, we do. But, you know, these guys can't swap faces again. I mean, we can't do Travolta right. and Cage. I mean, that would be absurd. Right. And they were like, oh, well, never mind. We're not interested then. We were like, but all you did was complain about how expensive they were. You're like, ah, we don't want to do a sequel if it's not Travolta and Cage. And now, like, oh. now this new director, writer, they're, aren't they trying to get them back? Yeah. I yeah. We don't, we don't know that. the story, but they are. Yes. They're trying to get them back. Maybe just but, for a prologue or teaser. Or something. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like a subplot. Yeah. My, my suspicion, although it's based on absolutely nothing, is my suspicion is... They're, they they want to use the young kid at the mm. who comes in it's Travol Caster's son Adam yep. of course would now be grown up. Uh, my my suspicion is like he's like the lead somehow, and those two guys would be like like they did in Star Wars, you know, like and that, they, that story they, wrapped up so well in the first film that it would be hard to without stretching too much. Like I like your guys' idea right. of taking the concept instead of the story and using that as a continuation device. Like just that this is this is the thing that connects it to the first one. It's just the concept of what's happening, yeah. the theme, instead of uh just a, an actual like you know continuation of the first story. Um question, was it a coincidence that Adam wound up with Eve at the end of the movie? <laughs> Yeah, or, why not? You caught us. <laughs> <laughs> you caught us. Okay. Hey, the Bible, so that's the greatest story ever written. What you pro guys probably don't know is that there are quite a lot of All About Eve references in the movie. There was a character named Mayor Channing, I think. There, there was quite a lot of, we were, we were, Mike's a big fan of All About Eve and we were 
my favorite script. Yeah, and um, he, so we anyway. So there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of all that he referenced. Uh, your script uh, earned you a Saturn Award from the Academy of Science and Fiction. It also got Best Movie at the MTV Movie Awards. What kind of effect does that kind of validation have on you as writers when, like, you're after that the the isolation experience? So when you start getting the accolades from the real world, how does how does that affect you? Well, at least we were invited to the Saturn Awards. We weren't invited to the MTV Awards. <laughs> That's true. That's crazy. I, we were pretty annoyed about that. <laughs> Everybody's celebrating this great thing we did, but we're not here. Look, oh, wow. I, w- I wasn't going to go, but I wanted to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a particular line or a dialogue or sequence that you most, you're most proud of from this film? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, for me. It's kind of a very quiet scene, you guys, but um, maybe... Well, you've seen the movie recently, I guess, very recently, so it may resonate with you. To me, it's 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 underwritten in the script, but I think Travolta gives and Joan Allen gives such a bravura moment. It's when um, uh, Travolta is about to go out to his office, back up to the FBI office, at, you know, even though he's the bad guy at this point. And mm-hmm. Joan Allen, uh, Eve Archer tells him, you know, I know you don't want to do this, but we have to do it. And and he doesn't know, but he's like agrees. And then they it's the scene where they end up at um, at uh, their son's grave. And it's so emotionally packed because Travolta at first is like, you know, he's going along with the program. But you can really see in his acting in this scene that for possibly the first time in his life, he can feel a victim's pain because there he is holding the the mother of the child he killed, having to comfort her. And there's no way unless you're, you know, 100 percent a monster that that would not mean something to you. And I, I just love that scene, even though it's very quiet. You can kind of see it come out in his character when uh, when he when. Uh, he's yelling. At, I can't. I can't even remember now if it's Nicholas Cage or John Travolta as Caster Troy at this point. But it's it's after that moment where he's like, "The kid was an accident." He did say, but, that. and he's he saying say it almost like he's regretted. Like that's right. the equivalent of the most that he can do to ask for forgiveness. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, that was very deep. Can yeah, that's Nick Cage in the first yeah. couple minutes when he shoots him, and this is the moment when I I saw, first saw this, I thought, "Oh shit, this is like going to be good." is when Nick shoot pulls the trigger. It's the opening sequence. He pulls the trigger and the kid gets hit. And then there's a shot back. This is the genius of John Woo. There's a shot back at Nick and Nick looks up over the scope like, oh, fuck. Like, like mm-hmm. the, even in that one quiet moment, it, it showed some complexity, not the same old bad guy, like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, fuck, like this went really sideways, which, of course, you know, he probably happens all the time to him. But in, in that moment, I thought, oh, wow, this is like, the, the ju- you know, and very powerful to have been powerful. so early on in the movie to let you know that this is going to be yeah. uh, a more uh, more dimensions than your typical action film. And, yeah. And similar to that, there's one other moment similar to that, which I, I particularly love, which is at the end on the bo- endless boat chase. <laughs> when they're both beating the shit out of each other like endlessly. And that was like a quarter of what they shot. But there's this moment when the boat is like going to hit the shore and there's a shot of the two of them turning and looking together at like what's about to happen and the look of like, oh, fuck. Like the, the opponent is forgotten for one second as they kind of both <laughs> share the dread of what's about to happen. And I love I just I love that moment too. That's a great metaphor for the world in general. It's like, hey, oh, we're right. all on this big yeah. ship. Yeah. Th- this shit ship that's yeah. going it's down. Like, this reminds me of Peter Sellers again being there. Let's set, the, the, rivals, set the, the rivalry aside for a moment <laughs> here. There's bigger fish to fry. Okay. All right. So lastly, before we move on from face off, is there anything else that you think the fans or any one of the film may want to know about face off that they just do not know that you are at liberty to speak on? Well, Interestingly, I mean, this is not that interesting story, I hate to tell you, but we were annoyed when the movie was done and it was about to come out that they, they studio refused to 
uh, have it like go to, you know, have like the, the press from Fangoria and all these science fiction places, uh, magazines and stuff, because they were terrified. of. We didn't realize this, but they were terrified of the science fiction part. And we were like, we just shook our heads like, well, why did they make this movie? And it's a sci fi movie. And of course, they sold it on John Woo and its action and all that stuff. But um, I think they made him as kind of, yeah, I think they kind of overthought that a little bit. I think that the movie really would have done well um, among, sci- you know, if they had appealed to science fiction audiences. Mm-hmm. Maybe about yeah. the ending, Michael. That oh, well, the ending. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. That's a good one. Well, the thing is this, um, we were going to shoot, you know, we had written in the script that uh, they adopt Adam at the end of the movie. And we were not allowed to shoot that. It was the only scene. We, we were told, you know, basically trickled down from the studio, <laughs> not that far, it went straight to us from the top, saying that uh, American audiences would not accept the... Uh, uh, the uh, the bad seed joining going into that household after all they'd been through, and they you know they made a very logical argument for that, but we were still extremely disappointed when that scene was cut uh, and never shot. Well, we were all in Burbank or Glendale uh, in you know part of LA for I think it was the first of two test screens. Yeah, it was the first one. And if the first one, and, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever been a participant in a test screening, but, you know, they show the movie and there's all these uh, 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 flyers, people check off boxes. And then there's a moderator that comes in and asks questions of the audience. Charlie, we're here to judge whatever film we're going to be shown. Thundergun 4, Maximum Cool. Well, what we didn't know, but what, we were all in some Mexican restaurant at the end, all these, uh, you know, hundreds of responses came back. And even though the moderator never asked any question about the end of the movie, and it was favorably, you know, we got good, good ratings, not great, but good ratings at the end. It was apparently like two thirds of the hundreds of people that were in the recruitment audience who didn't know what they were seeing, except they had to be of a certain age. They had all written down, what happened to that kid? (laughs) Two thirds of the people took the time to write that, that it was not satisfying to them to not know what happened to Gina's daughter. She died. The brother was done. What happened to that boy? And so to their credit, the head of the studio at the time, Sherry Lansing, Michael Douglas, uh, Steve Ruther, the producers, they turned to us and said, you guys were right. And then the next day, uh, now you tell the rest of this. Yeah. Story. So the next day, my phone, my, my, I hear my the phone rings in my apartment really early and it's John Wu's assistant saying John wants, I had given up already. Like I was like, Oh, okay, well, whatever. You know, the I couldn't believe the movie ever even got made. That's not what happened. No, no, I'm going to get there. <laughs> so the phone, so the phone rings, and and uh, uh, Lawrence Walsh, John's assistant, says, "Oh, could you please fax over?" That's how long ago it was. Could you please fax over the original last scene where Adam uh, comes back to the house? So I call Mike, and I go, "Hey, what do you, you know? They want Lawrence called. They want these pages. What do you think they want this for? Is this like why do you think they want that?" And Mike goes, "Are you kidding?" Oh my God! And he understood right away that they they were going to shoot it. So at the cost of half a million dollars, we went back to Pacific Palisades to the location and uh, and shot the original ending. I remember that a little differently, Michael. I re- I do not remember Lauren, and you may be right, but maybe this is just you know it, time is so much time has passed. But I remember the phone ringing early in the morning, waking me up, and it was John Wu on the line. Oh, okay. And John Wu was saying, you know, that he wanted those pages sent over. He wanted to look look at them. And, uh, And I said, sure. I called you. You were already awake. Oh, maybe that was it. 
And you asked me, well, what does he want those pages for? And yeah. I burst into tears. <laughs> telling you that, yeah, don't you understand? We got our fucking ending back. Yeah, We're I had no kind of this. clueless. That's exact. That is correct. That is correct. Yes, I remember now. You called oh, very emotional. It was no, there was no intermediary. Yeah, that's hilarious. Well, no, I think what happened was I got a message on my machine early. And then you, and then you, when you called, it was like, yeah, what's that about? You were anyway, but that's true. Yeah. Then they reshot that scene. Thank God. At the next test screening, they went, I mean, our numbers, we were told our numbers were higher than Forrest Gump. Wow. Wow. It, wow. it was a seismic shift in how the audience walked out of the theater. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's crazy. I mean, wow, okay. That is something we didn't know about the film. And then there was, an, Michael, didn't we have another thing where one of the pay, setup and payoffs was that uh, uh, Sean Archer and Jamie at the beginning are playing basketball. Yeah, yeah. And he's really bad at it and he can't sink a shot which right. is discuss his daughter. And then at the end, Travolta, Sean Archer is, is just, you know, it's in the middle of the night. He can't sleep. He gets up and he just starts sinking basket, three point shot oh, after three point yeah. shot. Yeah. And the audience is left to wonder when did he suddenly get this skill or who is that? Because we, yeah, cool. we had, we had had Castor doing it earlier as in, I forget where somewhere. Right. Well, that's a testament to a rich story is when you can, when multiple ways to end it all still work so well. Because you just, you set up such an effective story with great characters. Thank you so much. Yeah, seriously. Thank you so much. Keep right, keep writing and we'll keep watching. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Thanks all right, for trying to do the same. All yes, right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye. All right. Born in Indiana, raised in Wyoming, he joined the Marines in 1985, where he served in Desert Shield and Desert Storm until 1996. And by 1997, had found a new home through various roles in the film industry, working on films such as Rules of Engagement, Band of Brothers, Starship Troopers, Wag the Dog, Blue Streak, Spy Game, Alexander, Captain America, The First Avenger, World War Z, Galaxy Quest, Coyote Ugly, Balls of Fury, among many others, and of course, Face Off. With experience as a prop master, special effects technician, technical advisor, personal assistant, horse rider, and stunt performer, and coordinator, we're guessing a few other odd jobs as well that I need to be missed. We're excited to welcome Freddie Joe Farnsworth. Thank you very much for being here, Freddie Joe. Oh, thank you. Face Off was at least according to nine to be the first film that you were a technical advisor on how, how did you end up working on that production you know what basically i i wouldn't call myself the technical advisor what happened as as you guys know being around uh, uh, uh the business the, the armor was rock galati who was a former marine and he also did starship troopers and uh the uh all the swat entry and stuff at the big party you know he had we had uh, M88, 50 cows, and everybody had all their weapons. And he got me hired on just to kind of help out with the stunt guys. And, you know, I was trying to – I didn't know anybody. I, I was in the Marines. I, didn't, I thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't know a damn thing about what I was doing. And he's like, hey, come in. I want you to help out, make sure all the background are good and the stunt guys. And, yeah. So, I mean, literally, I worked on it a few days, but it, it was a, a good experience. Everybody kind of looked at me like I was stupid because I looked like I was, like, 12 back then, even though I was – uh yeah, uh, what, 28, 29 years old. I want you to take me inside the mind of a technical advisor because we have a what well, we we have a section of our audience and we call them the film schools because we want people in film school to come and learn from our show. And, and you're one of the people that we've had on who te- are what we call a technical advisor. So I want to know what that process is like uh, as far as you preparing. And if you were to teach, let's say, someone coming into the industry as an intern, what's the training you would provide them as far as being a technical advisor? Because as we know, that can that role can differ from film set to film set you know that that, i mean that's it i mean i've done from 330 uh bc all the way to 27 35 ad i i do do like to teach a lot of young guys majority of them in fact almost basically all of them either have a law enforcement or a military background and each each project will determine what you have to do you know it's i i here's the funny thing you always come with this silly plan you know we write it down oh we're going to do this and we're going to do that we're going to do that and then about three seconds into the 
I completely forget the plan and I just play it off the cuff. So it's all about, you know, uh, depending on what the project is to basically take my knowledge of being in combat, being in the military. And there's a famous thing one time I had an actor tell me, he goes, Oh, you have not apparently seen my resume. I've, you know, I've, you know, all this crazy crap. And I was like, really? He goes, I can play tired if I can put, if I want to. And I was like, okay. All right. So I commenced at that point to show him really what being tired was. And then after being tired, taking it to the next level and being able to perform your job, which is like military or law enforcement. You can't stop in the middle of something and say, oh, I'm so exhausted. You got to stop shooting at me. Give me a five seconds to figure myself out. So, yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's certain things like that. The mindset of uh, of a warrior or a person who will step in front of a bullet is completely different than the normal human being reaction. I mean, the normal human being reaction is, oh, shit, die behind the tree. So you just kind of have to teach them that there's uh, something that they've never seen at that level before. I don't really I don't really bring people in and say, oh, you're going to be my apprentice and you're going to learn or whatever. I, I usually just. I, the, the people that I bring in, I have a lot of young guys, Chad Ben, Robert Garcia, who now are starting to get successful in their own right. Um, I bring them in. They come to me. They have to show me. They have to be able to get into my inner circle to prove that they really want to succeed. Because the, the, the film is completely different than real life. If we filmed real life, everybody would be asleep in the first eight minutes of the show. So you have to learn film first. And scripts and and, and 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 the direction of directors and, and and the writers and so on and so forth and then take your knowledge and experience and move that forward. With uh, with Face Off, who did you primarily work with, or or like what was your what was your position or or, or your role? Like what what did that specifically entail on that production? Well, I basically worked with the SWAT teams. So um, w- when the big party was going on in the, in the uh, I mean, let's just say that was 25 years ago. So I'm trying to trying to remember 25 years ago, 300 different projects. But um, <laughs> basically, it's when the SWAT teams were coming in. It, it's a funny story. Was we, were, we were downtown L.A. And, and, of course, I had never been downtown L.A. And this was back before staple centers and all that stuff. So it was a little rough down there. And. So I got to spend a few minutes with some of the background performers and a lot of the stunt guys because we were, you know, they're busting into the roof, doing the whole party. It's when uh, Mr. Nicholas and, and uh, Mr. Zavolta kind of meet, you know, he's he, he's a police, he, he's the SWAT, in the SWAT team police guy. This guy's now the partier. So basically, all I did was spend a few minutes making sure all the uniforms look good, make sure they're carrying the weapons all right, make sure they all, if they didn't know how to use the weapon, we, you know, Rock, uh, Rockalotti would say, hey, Freddie Joe, you know, show him how to hold the weapon, how to shoot it and everything. And then uh, that was basically it. It was, it was pretty plain. I mean, it was, it was come in. And, and to be honest with you, I thought, man, this Hollywood shit is easy as shit, but I was full of, you know, I'm, so, I really didn't I'm glad you said that. About. I wouldn't say that it's easy, but I will say this. It's like, People don't understand how many parts go into making a film. And with someone like yourself, like it's easy for you. Like, listen, I, I'm I'm such a part of this art, but I just had to know what I already knew before I got here. So it's like Hollywood is essentially a bunch of people who, who are perfectionists at their careers coming together to make something great because I know the film that we did and I'm going to kill someone this Friday. We bought in someone who is a fanatic about guns and we didn't know that at the time. He was just like, we, we just needed somebody to show us how to put a gun together on film. And he, and right. when he came in and did it like, in my opinion, I guess we kind of took it for granted. Like we had an armorist, we had someone who, like, someone. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there a question? Well, no. It's just more <laughs> as a statement. I was waiting on you to say it because we didn't know that we would have that at first. Because you can tell somebody pretending to put a gun together mm-hmm. versus someone like if we had him on set or the guy that we had to show us, like, no, this is not how a person would put a gun together. And if you're doing a true film, this is how it's done. Well, yeah, and, oh, and right. you, you got people must be putting a lot of faith in you because you're the person that knows. So Correct. like like when we did that scene that he's talking about, I had to put complete faith in the person that we chose to do that because I couldn't fact check what he was doing. I didn't know if it was right or wrong. It looked cool, but I, I that's about the, the as much as I could say about it. And he so I would imagine it's the same with you when you go on a set as an advisor or something along those lines that 
people are looking, they're putting all their faith in the accuracy that you're providing. I mean, that's true to a point. Uh, for some reason, though, you know, there are actors out there that read that manual that, you know, uh, actors deserve this and they should be pampered and they have a trailer and, and I don't have to do this. I don't have to use that. I just show up and, you know, my makeup is done perfect and everything's hunky dory. So sometimes you kind of have to fight with them a little bit, which, which is pretty simple. But, you know, it's, what, what I tell everybody all the time is basically, you know, if I have to tell you my resume, or especially when we were talking about teaching people or, or apprentice earlier, if you have to tell them your resume, if you have to talk yourself up, you're not going to be any good at this. You know, when you walk on set, you, a good actor, a good stunt performer, a good performer, period, you know, when you walk on set, if they don't look at me going, that dude's the shit right there. I, I want to be like him. Then I'm not doing my job right. So, you know, just like you said, you, you, you didn't know somebody was going to be there. But often there's a guy there and you watch him do it. and You're like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. You know, so a, a good performer or, or, or a, 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 will literally pay attention to every step that they take and go through that you know, that whole avenue that it takes to give that, per what he just did to you, now take that and put it on camera. I mean, you talk about Rough Riders earlier. My first acting part was in Rough Riders. And it was because, I mean, my last four years in the Marines, I was at Marine Combat, uh, Marine Combat training. So I was training Marines to go to combat. And my last couple of years, I was an instructor and, I, and as a weapons instructor. So I was teaching weapons. So now it came in instinctively for me on the set and I was teaching uh, Sam Elliott. You know, I did this whole thing. I used it. Uh, I had to do a little sniper, a little shot in the scene for John Milius. And we set it up and Sam Elliott was just, in tr he was just like, I wish I knew that when I was a kid, how to make a sling, you know, hasty sling and do everything with the weapon. So I, I was sitting there teaching him and I only taught him at the time because I was naive. I taught him like I just got out of the Marine. So <laughs> I was teaching him like a Marine. And I, little did I know John Milius was behind me. And Sam Milliot was going through all the motions by the numbers, you know, one, two, three, do, do your whole thing. And John Milius just said, hey, kid, you're going to put that in the movie. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> he gave me a big part. Yeah. yeah, it, was, hey. it, it like tripped me out. And I thought, oh, shit, I can do that. And in that film, I played Sergeant Farms. You know, anytime they don't have time to clear your name or something. You just use your own name. So I've been Sergeant Farns with quite a few times. What I wanted to know really quick now, here's the thing, because I see these things on YouTube all the time, and we're going to do our own thing here. So uh, today we have our special guest technical advisor here. What I would like to know, in all the films you've seen, as someone who's a technical advisor, what's something you've seen in any movie that you knew, hey, that's fucking wrong. Somebody should be a fucking shame. If they're hiring people to do that, I need more jobs. Talk to me. <laughs> Wow, that uh, that that that's a big list. Um, <laughs> that's a big list. What's the what's at the top? What's the top three of your list? Somewhere in there, somewhere in there. Oh my gosh! You know, one of the top one is uh, being a marine is the, the movie Marine, the first one. Mm. Oh, the very first thing you see is they're wearing army uniforms. They have a, a <laughs> what they call a castle style cap. It's not, you know, <laughs> like what? <laughs> it's all over the place. You know, I always tell everybody this. I'm like, look. You guys, you two, you know, uh, uh, anybody listening, they can name their five greatest war films of all time. You know, me, Saving Private Ryan, you know, even the shows Banner Brothers, the Pacific, all these shows. Every one of them had a great tech advisor, a, a tech advisor that was attention to detail. He was like watched every little, little piece and minute thing. Now, name your five worst, and I guarantee you there wasn't a tech advisor on it, you know, or, or there wasn't a <laughs> non line like shot story. Hot shots too. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> that that sure shit was that funny, right there. That, that, I, I like it was that. funny, but yeah, I get you. You what I'm saying? It was funny though. I'm sure it yeah. trickles down to the cast too, like the confidence that someone like you can instill in the in the performers, where they go out on the set and they can actually feel like they're doing the right thing. That you've, I, I've been on independent film sets before where you quickly pick up on the fact that, okay, this is a shit show. And then you immediately just kind of start dialing back the energy that you're willing to exhaust on it. Like, you know, and, and 
So I think if if somebody is coming into a production and and they see the preparation that's going into it with someone like you, and then they come in, they come onto the onto the set to do their scenes, and they actually feel confident in what they're doing. It um, I guarantee it helps the overall process. And when like you know, I'm not here, I'm like what the, they didn't even do any research on this. I know damn well this is an army uniform, and, and I'm supposed to be a marine. What is what is happening? It just shows you how feeble the mind is, and if it sells, the the green light people don't care. Um, what the flip side of that is, what what film comes to mind that got it absolutely perfect? Please say Tombstone. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, no, he no. Well, no, why did... two, not three. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, no, none of them get it perfect. Uh, okay. and, you know, uh, you know, I, I did when I, I did Spy Games was actually the first huge production I ever did by myself with nobody around. Mm-hmm. It was just me and with Brad and and, and, and uh, Robert Redford, uh, and we're out in Morocco. I you love know, Spy and, Games. I fucking yeah, you know. love Spy Games. It's what they tried to do with the first Mission Impossible. You wouldn't know about that. With William Defoe and uh, Tom Cruise. Because it's like, no, this is how it was really supposed to be done. Give me right. give me, will, give me, Robert Redford in a fucking prison cell. And give it like, 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 are you kidding me? Like, it, like, I didn't even, here's the thing. You have to understand for me being, I'm 38 years old. I knew the name Robert Redford. I have to know him because I am an actor, but I, to me, it made me go back and watch more Robert Redford films to say, oh shit, he's giving me this and this. Are you fucking kidding? Right. Like, shh, have you seen it? No. You got to fucking see oh, it. I, I, I'm gathering. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, 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 you know, on top of that, also, you know, uh, God rest his soul, you know, Tony Scott as well. I mean, just, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you meet people like Tony Scott, it, it, you learn what filmmaking is all about. I mean, it, 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 he, uh, well, I blew his mind and he blew my mind. Let's put it that way. <laughs> we were freaking you know, mad. <laughs> I got that job. It was so funny. I, 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 was, I was finishing Band of Brothers and I got a call. Hey, man, you know, we want you to come down cause, uh, to Pinewood Studios. Uh, because you know that's where the, the production was out in England. I was in England filming, and they're like, "Just come down and meet these people." You know, we might might want you to tech advise this film. And so I went over and met them and everything. And and like I said, I, I looked like a baby when I when I was young. Now I look like an old bastard. But uh, I met them, and they were just like, "No, it's a Vietnam film. You're way too young. We're looking for an older guy." You know, the whole thing was like, oh, "Okay, whatever." I, you know, back then I was like, I still had them ring tell. I was like, "Ah, really? I don't give a shit. Whatever. You know, go fuck yourself." And, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yes <laughs> you know, but literally, so, but I had thrown, I did a movie, you know, when I did rules of engagement, I, you know, I also did stunts on that as well as tech advising and training people. And, and Sam, Samuel Jackson was in my, uh, was the guy I trained in it. And, uh, you know, he was one of the guys, you know, I trained with, uh, I don't know, probably 40, 50 other background performers. And, when we were in Morocco, Sam was, you know, getting a little ahead of himself. And we were in uh, a place called Berber Palace and everybody was throwing people in the pool. So Sam was up there and he had his little security guys yeah. around, you know, and he's doing his stuff, laughing, you know, doing, hey, motherfucker, you're going to drown, all that shit. You know, and I was like, sit back there and I'm like, why don't somebody throw Sam in the pool? And he's like, you bitches ain't man enough. And I just freaking cell phone wallet. I didn't give a shit. You know, big old Wyoming right. fella flop, grabbed his ass and we went in the pool to the deep end. And I mean, he, I felt bad. He fired a security detachment after that, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I guess we can ask you what your favorite memory of that set was. <laughs> I love that story. Keep them coming. Fast forward. Ty Tegler was the prop master. Ty did, does a lot of the Star Wars. Big, one of the biggest in the world. Wonderful man. And uh, I was walking out of the office, and he just stopped me and goes, "Hey, you're the guy that threw Samuel Jackson in the pool in front of everybody." And I'm like. Yeah. And he goes, okay. And I didn't hear nothing. No, but two days later, I got a call. Hey, the art department wants you to come to Morocco and, you know, make Morocco look like Vietnam, basically. And I was like, yeah, okay. I'm finishing Band of Brothers. Might as well. Band of Brothers was fucking awesome. I thought it was yeah. really cool that uh, the interview you did with, uh, um, with, I keep wanting to say Taco. Is it Taco? I don't Where's know. Taco? For some reason, it doesn't sound right Where's to me. What to call? Um, and his I, name and is I'll Mitchell the... Bell. So, so his call sign is a pilot was Taco Bell. So he goes Taco by Taco. Bell, okay. I'm going to put the link for that interview in the description when we post this because I want people to check it out. It was really cool. Well, there was one thing uh, that you mentioned on there about Samuel Jackson that I thought was just so awesome. The why he's your favorite actor. The the 
when all the military families were there and uh, for uh, their ref in a, a shoot or something. And he was going to the, you know, he had, the, they called all the actors to the press play where, you know, to, to talk to the press, he pretty much made them wait so he can give the military families there the time of day and was one of the only actors to do that. Like, it's so cool when you love an actor and then you find out that they're actually not a shit person on top of that yeah. and i i just went ahead and recapped that whole thing i didn't want to put that on you because i want people to actually watch your you you tell the story much better in that interview and uh i, well, I don't know you did pretty out. good <laughs> now that's I'll, the preface so I, I i i wanted to say we the, remember we were watching the matrix and we thought about that line no, yes, tell them you, about that in that inner in the interview with taco again you said something that reminded me of a uh of a line in the new matrix film I, it's uh the guy says, anyone can be you. You could never be me. Right. And it, the it was guy, so, you mean the guy, the new Smith, Agent Smith? Yeah, Thank you. Thank Smith. you. The guy. Oh, Jesus um, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting because your your role as a military instructor creates this interesting dynamic between you and these big time actors. And it's just such a, a it's, it's an interesting di uh, dichotomy between the two of you because you have this it's obvious when i listen to you talk that you have this respect for the craft that they that they do you have do you have your respect for their craft but at the same time it's your job to break them in a lot of cases and it, it seems like from in your with your military background you kind of wear that with a badge of honor to, to like you know to to break somebody down and it also comes with the, the as much respect you have for their craft you have more respect for the uniform that they're going to wear and portray. So can you you talk about that as far as like what uh, what your mindset is going into a situation where it's your it's your job to break down some A-list actor that is oh, never been told no. <laughs> <laughs> um well you know one of the first things you got to do is they have been told no. They just recently have been told no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> back to what you said, you know, I can be you, but you can't be me is, you know, I, I, I guest starred in Steven Spielberg, you know, a, a Steven Spielberg movie, you know, uh, I've done acting in what, 17, 18, whatever, whatever. I've, you know, doubled some of the biggest actors in the world. I've definitely trained the biggest actors in the world. So you always sit in front of an actor, you know, that has been to college and has, uh, you know, got a few roles and now they got their big opportunity to be in a, uh, you know, uh, a Spielberg or a Tom Hanks or, you know, a Sky or some film, whatever, whoever it is, you know, Brad Pitt, whatever. Like I said, they've read that book in, in that and they have this thing. And a lot of it comes from they, they go on a set and they see Robert De Niro, you know, and 18 people following him around and carrying his stuff and doing his stuff. So they kind of get this, oh, I'm going to be that person. I, I, you know, I'll have people taking care of me instead of me doing myself, which is very few people get that. But I always, you're right. One of the first thing I always tell them is, especially when I'm doing military shows as a tech advisor, it's basically, you know, I can be you. I've acted. There's, you know, hundreds and thousands of people have been you. So you're nothing special. But you can't be that. me. You haven't stood on the line. You haven't worried about the man or the woman to the left and right of you. If, you know, you'd rather put your life on the line than they do. You know, mm -hmm. you haven't cleaned your weapon just to make sure it functions so you don't die. You haven't, you know, had a malfunction in the middle of a firefight. You haven't had to call F-18s in, you know, at the same time you got mortars and, you know, popping smoke. And I'm sorry. You, you're saying a lot of great stuff and I and never interrupt our guests. Could you could you say that first statement again? You haven't cleaned your weapon to what now? Come again, because I'm going to quote that. You have to clean your weapon to be able to fire it, you know, because it's sure jamming and stuff. You know, it, there, there, there's all kinds of. Of, of things that as a human being, you know, especially nowadays, you know, you watch online and you watch on TV and, and, you, and you think you friggin' know, you know, but it's like being an actor. Everybody's like, oh, <laughs> I can be an actor. That That's what all they got to do is do dialogue and look pretty. Michael. But here's the funny thing. The first time I taught, I played Sergeant Farnsworth. I taught a weapon system. I got to write my own lines and Rough Riders. And as soon as John Milley said action, I just went, what the fuck? I don't know what I don't even know what my name is. What am I doing here? You know, of course, I was lucky that he, you know, he was a really good director and he recognized that, you know, I'm a flamboyant guy, you know, back then, especially, you know. And uh he just said, prison set, everybody go to lunch. And it was just me and the camera guys. He said, All right, do, do your thing. I was gonna say, I know one person that's a fan of your acting. 
I'm gonna tell you why. You know who? You know how I guarantee I know this. The greatest compliment you've ever received was hearing Donnie Wahlberg tell you how his dad, had, how he hired three guys to prepare him from a role, but you broke him in. Not, uh, let's just call it 180 seconds. That's three minutes where I come from. Uh, how did how did how did you break Donnie? I gotta know. <laughs> Yeah, that was that, that was a great compliment. That's when you know you're doing it right, Donnie. Comparing for Band of Brothers, you know he, you know I, you know, I, you know he's one of the whatever new kids on, the, you know whatever. And uh, <laughs> he had some money and doing his thing. And he said, "Man, I had the money. I I hired three Navy Seals, and I heard there was Marines going to train me. So I, I mean, he goes eight weeks. They trained me for everything, and I was going to, which I understand. I love that competitive attitude. I was going to show these assholes when I showed up." You know, and my dad, who never, you know, before, you know, before I took my dad to Paris for the premier band of brothers, my dad was kind of, you know, old school dad from Wyoming, you know, he's like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, you're an idiot. You know, so I was like, come on, dad, we'll fly out there. You know, they fly his business class, pay for all the drinks. Now my dad's kind of like, damn, my son's kind of cool. And uh, we're sitting on a bus and Donnie looked at him and he goes, Mr. Farnsworth, he goes, I just want to tell you something, he said, you know, and he's the same thing, you know, I had all these Navy SEALs training me and I was ready. I was going to punch him in the mouth. I was ready to make him eat my dust. And he said, in three minutes, I was broke. <laughs> he said, I would do anything. He was petrified of me. He said, I hid from him. <laughs> he said, but I learned so much from him about, you know, who I am today, what I can't do. Or, or you know, he pushed me to the, to the limit. You, you know, we all have that wall. Is, you know, he goes, but he pushed me even farther on that wall. And I just thought that was the greatest compliment, you know, to have an actor that, I mean, he's done all kinds of stuff and, and, and he's very athletic and wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, just to tell my father that I was like, man, that's one of the greatest compliments I've ever had. It means that much more too, to when you overhear a compliment, it's not told to you and even, even better that it's said that it was said to your dad. Like that's, yeah, that's really cool. Out of all those names that you see everybody that makes movies, the actors are the only ones pretending. Everybody else actually does what they do. How crazy is mm -hmm. that? <laughs> you ever thought about that? Ridiculous. I mean, there's some actors <laughs> that have done it. Well, I'm an actor, so I'm throwing shit on myself. But I mean, hey, we're great at what we do, too. Well, you know, uh, it goes back to the same thing. You know, I can be you, but you will never be me because you'll never be able to, you know, you'll be able to play it on, on camera, but you Correct. will not ever have done it in real life. But I can't play them on camera with somebody like you who actually does it. Who has to? I have to study you to do what I have to well, do. Well, not necessarily. I mean, yeah. If I'm John Wick, <laughs> exactly. You know what you do. Is you, <laughs> yeah. Also, too, you know, a lot of things I do is, you know, why I'm filming is because, uh, you know, I get in detail and I, I, uh, I grow characters as well. You know, because you have, a, as you know, you have a lot of actors that think they know what, you know, oh, the guy was shy or the guy was this, and the guy was that, and but it, in the military and in combat, things that those words mean different things. So during training and boot camp and stuff, what I do is I start molding them. You know, if they're a good leader, I kind of give them the little answers to the test without anybody knowing. And all of a sudden they're like, how the fuck did you know to do that shit? Well, you know, we're going to start following that guy. And then the, the guy's supposed to be a dumbass in the script. I start giving him the wrong answers. And he, you know, and then I thrash the shit out of everybody, wear their ass out. And then everybody starts hating him for real. They're like, you just shut the fuck up. Barnes is going to kill us. You know, just stop doing it. <laughs> So, it, and it just kind of builds them characters within the script. And, you know, it's, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's how you get shows like Band of Brothers. It wasn't just me, it's Dale Dye and, and a couple other tech advisors that we really got into each character, you know. And I, you know, I was with, I had like Garnier and Compton, all those, I was lucky, I had all the like deep, deep characters. So I really got to play them, you know. You were recently reunited with Nicolas Cage, in a sense, doing stunts on the recent film, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Are you at liberty to talk about your work on that production at all? Sure, I did stunts on it. I don't give a shit. It, it, looks, it, it, it looks insane. So, yeah, whatever you could share, I'd, I'd love yeah, to Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, I, I did some uh, stunt coordinator brought me in, uh, Miss, uh, Ben Scott, you know, for some pickup shots. And... Uh, it was him and Demi, and I just had to, to make this SUV do stuff that it's not supposed to be able to do, and that's what I did. And it, uh, I only worked on it a day, but it was really kind of cool. You know, it wasn't like when I did, uh, I just say Face Off, I met John Travolta's stunt double, and, you know, then he brought, when he was doing primary colors, he was fixing to do uh, uh, um, the, the World War II film. And 
he his stunt double said, "Hey, John, we got I got this guy. He's wanting to be a stunt double," and uh, he brought me in. He got got me a job that never made it in the film, never did nothing. I worked for three days, made good money, just to sit in his trailer and tell him about being a military guy. <laughs> that was really cool, you know how it kind of leapfrog. But Nicholas was yeah. more like I had you know, a guy I hadn't seen him in twenty five years, and I did say hi to him and said, "Hey, man, I remember you. I met you a couple times on Face Off." And you know, of course, he gave me the "Oh yeah, I remember." And that was about it. I want to ask you this, so it's a perfect segue, but I don't want to ask you as a technical advisor, just as a fam- fan of watching the film, of just in the audience, pop corner at home, what was your favorite scene of the film? I, I really honestly like the transition that Nicolas Cage made when he, because Nicolas always, to me, he always plays kind of that, ah, you know, this, let's go, you know, <laughs> kind of guy. But when he went to be that serious John Travolta, you know, agent, Dude, I, yeah. I honestly, I really liked that. I was like, holy plot shit. Plot thickens. <laughs> What's yeah. that? The plot thickens when he met his daughter. I'm like, as a child, I didn't see it. Exactly. But as an adult, we watched it. I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh. <laughs> You're like, no. <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> I really like that. He's got a brand new bag. Really Take it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was really smart. Smart film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I agree with you, too. I was surprised by. I, I won't say surprise because I know Nicolas Cage is a great actor, but I've never seen him like stoic uh, almost. He was yeah, yeah it was crazy. Do an impression without it being like a parody. That's that's that he went so still. deep. He was into the world of actually acting. It was crazy. He wasn't yeah. being like he said, man. And don't get me wrong, what he does is beautiful. But he went another way with it. He showed a range that we didn't think he had. We didn't know there was a decaffeinated cage, and he showed it to <laughs> us, and it was exactly. still great. It was still great. Yeah. And, John, and honestly, John did a good job, too, playing the, you know. I mean, who could play Nick, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a pretty good actor, too. He's done some good stuff. I, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. talk shit about anybody. Just, you know. Yeah. No, no, I wasn't talking shit about John. I wasn't talking shit about John. I was just saying that Nicolas Cage is so manic and out there. It's just kind of like, and John is so great at what he does, but that's he doesn't do Nick. And so to ask John to do Nick, me and him, when we reviewed the film, we said, we don't think anybody, I mean, I mean, we, we gave John Travolta like the second best actor in the film. We're like, that's no, that's no shitting on him. Who the fuck can do Nicolas Cage other than Nicolas Cage? So shit, he, great job, John. Yeah, between the two of them, John Travolta definitely had the harder task. <laughs> yes, and he and he brought it. He made me think he was Caster fucking Troy. He had to call up his guy like, "Look, I'm going to." When he, when he licked his daughter's face, I was like, "That's Nick Cage. Here we go. <laughs> Look out, there. <laughs> I got three daughters. Oh, going to kill people. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I got one. I'm like, yeah, one. That, yeah, I, that when I watched that as a teenager, it never dawned on me the implications of everything that was happening. I was like, oh man, he's so cool. But now it's like, oh, so man, creepy, you, cool, yeah. so so chill. Yeah, so <laughs> it was kind of creepy into like the bone kind of creepy. And when, yeah. when he reached past his daughter trying, he was like, you got something I want. I'm like, I, I'm too young to see this. And he grabs a cigarette. I'm like, I'm still too young to see this. Yeah. You <laughs> now, you're you me feel, now you're making me feel old. <laughs> oh, uh, no, no, no. Hey. <laughs> Is there a particular memory from the production that stands out to you? I, I was like kind of in awe because I was, you know, even though, you know, being a Marine, I think I'm experienced at everything as soon as I step in it. But. You know, I was very inexperienced in the film business at the time. And I thought I knew, oh, I, this is fucking easy shit for me. So I was, when I got downtown, kind of freaked me out. Downtown LA back then, you know, and the funny thing was I got everybody dressed as SWAT members and everybody was dressed up. And we had to walk from the base camp across the street, this, you know, high rise to go up to the roof. And watching people scatter was probably the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Literally, everybody thought the SWAT team was <laughs> so funny. It was hilarious. Oh my god, people were just like, you know, the police, like, ah, oh, you know, like, oh my god, you know. I thought that was pretty cool. Hey, listen, from the bottom of our hearts, we really thank you for coming on. Listen, if you do more work, hey, we would love to come on again. Or if we have something else coming up in the future where we need an actually arms expert, technical expert, and somebody who was a part of the 7th Battalion, make sure I get it right. Make sure I get the 7th Battalion, oh, right? We're going to do that new Nicholas Cage. Regiment. Comes out. 7th Regiment. I just want to make sure I get it right. 1st Battalion, 7th Marine. <laughs> First Battalion, Seven Marine, and that is the Seventh Regiment. Listen, it's been a pleasure speaking with you again. Thank you, seriously. All all jokes aside, thank you for your service, what you've done, and thank you for your expertise on coming on today. You've been one of the test best, the only technical advisor we've had. So thank you so much for what you've done. Yeah. 
Thank, Thank you. you so much, Freddie Joe. <laughs> you guys are awesome. And you're both in priest outfit. That is hysterical yes. because it was well, only we're... one scene in Face Off that that happened. It was such an iconic scene. Uh, when we were filming that, where was that? I think it was downtown in the L.A. Convention Center. Uh, I believe it's where we are filming that scene. I, I'm going to have to look at the call sheets, which I kept. But uh, I believe that that's where we're filming that, that, that scene. Listen, and people kept asking us, we did something on our channel to where we were like, hey, guys, we're trying to figure out what, what movie do we think you think we're doing? People were like, Sister Act, The Exorcist, this, that, and the other. And then when they found out it was Face Off, they was like, it was just one scene. I was like, well, it's one of the most iconic scenes ever. <laughs> and who doesn't want to be Nicolas Cage? That's all I'm saying. He was, he was just brilliant in that scene. It was perfect. He made it all up. You know what I mean? It was not scripted. He just like, he ad-libbed it all and he felt like it was going to work. From what I see, he edits in his own mind. He's editing his own scenes to work with the next scene or the previous scene in his own head. So if he if he makes it up on that spur of the moment, it's because he knows that it's going to work for the next segment of the film. I, I love what you're doing. And before we get too far into it, like, do not lose this energy, because I'll be honest with you. You are. When I said it's going to be a conversation, you jumped right into it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say three numbers. You've heard them before. It's called three, two, one. His attraction to the Hollywood lights led him to pursue a career as an actor, ultimately landing a sweet decade. That's 10 years for my people, Roman numeral kids. I know they don't teach it in school anymore. As Nicolas Cage, official stand in, which he recently produced a documentary called Uncaged, a stand in story. These days he works in investing, but his love and appreci appreciation for cinema is still very much alive and expressed through his po podcast called Babble, Bullshit and Beyond. A picture is worth a thousand words and he has a thousand pictures. Check out his website seriously. And uh, we're going to do our best to dig into as many great stories behind them as possible today. So I want to say thank you to very much to the Marco Kyrus for being here today. I will never call you Nicholas K. Stand in. You are Marco Kyrus because I'm an actor and we are no one stand in. You are awesome, sir. Thank you for coming on TTFT. How the hell are you doing today, sir? I'm fucking honored, is what I am, and I'm perplexed by it all. And uh, but it feels fun and funky and 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 goodsy. <laughs> I like the royalisms right out the way. I love yeah. it. Yeah. We were like, listen, it's one thing to be a stand in or be an extra to be a look alike, but for like for Nicolas Cage, like, no, there should be a special category for certain actors that for, for stand ins because, like, dude, how am I supposed to stand in for that? We were talking about hard, how hard it was for John Travolta to act like being Nicolas Cage. And here you are having to be like, like for all his films, was John Travolta had to do it for one film. You have to do it for every film. It's like, so that's why I say you say you didn't have any career. You didn't have like, you no, know, you have a special gift that only certain people would have. There's like probably th two people in the world that can mimic Nicolas Cage and it's you and it's Nicolas Cage. So, I mean, hey. You did have a certain air, uh, Nicolas Cage air about you. I noticed, uh, I noticed it more so now talking to you in, in uh, over Zoom in person Correct. more or less than uh, then, but when I was first looking at your pictures, I noticed in a lot of the behind the scenes pictures, you almost have uh, would assume like a Nicolas Cage air about just the way you were standing. And but he has a, the, like a certain way that he holds his mouth when he stands. Yeah, it's, it's almost just like letting gravity do whatever it wants. And and he forgot to close it sometimes. And I noticed that you had that a lot in the uh, in the behind the scenes pictures, almost like. It, almost like you're you were method acting to a degree as as a full time stand in for Nicolas Cage. The truth is, it was it became a full time job. I had accepted within myself that I'm never going to be an actor, and so once you let that part of it go. But now I'm in the union. Remember, I'm still a Screen Actors Guild person, and so you're working under the Screen Actor Guild agreements while you're in the states. And remember, mm -hmm. I, I also have a green card. So I can come and go freely. And Nick Cage knew all that. He did all his research before he hired me. It's not that he's like, oh, yeah, you here now. He knew everything about me ahead of time. He did research. They made phone calls. They checked out, you know, am I a good guy? Do I have a driver's license? And I had a California license and I have an Ontario license. And both were very valid. And there were, you know, no points and no DUIs and none of that stuff. A very clear record. So I was actually the perfect person to work for him. And that's exactly what I did. I became the method standard. So if he was wearing that wig in Con Air, I wore the wig in Con Air. And, you know, so it was, 
But I took it seriously because I also wanted to please the cinematographer and the director in these shots so it doesn't throw them off. So yeah. you really take it to as best as you can without getting in the actor's face or without distracting the director or the cinematographer while you're trying to, to bring the mood of Nick Cage's character to the camera. And that's what I was doing as best as I could without looking like a fool and without trying to mimic him because it's fucking impossible. Oh, I wanted to talk about his hustle because uh, you would you would be able to speak to this probably more so than anybody as you were literally walking in his every footstep for a good decade. And he it's just I know um, a lot of actors put in work, but he like. He puts in a lot of work. Like sometimes the Jackson amount of work. product that he's able to produce in a single year is just, it's it's just kind of baffling to be honest. Like, where how are you doing this? And I was wondering what your perspective of that from from your perspective, what that looked like, and just what was there a time continuum that was broken at any point <laughs> for him to produce like five films in a single year and they're good still they're all good performances and good films in their own right that's the other crazy thing every minute that he was awake he was working on his characters i saw the finished product as i was on set guys but i know that when he was in his trailer the setups are very long as you know when you get into these larger films like the setups are three hours to 13 hours sometimes, it depends on what it is. And I'm there for all of it. So I don't see the process of him working and, and studying and going through all of it. That's what he does in the trailer or at home whenever they bring him on the set. I'm on there with crew. So as I'm there with crew, I only see the finished product. And then I see if he wants to ad lib something or visually ad lib something that's not on the script because I'm always following the script. And then I, I didn't do something that he's doing and I'm like, that's not in the script. So like when he does that face off with the whole thing, uh -huh. that wasn't scripted. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm reading it and I'm like, what is, what is that on the monitor? <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> what? There was, it was no rehearsal. He just did it. Yeah. And everybody just stood back. I was there with the writers as well. And everybody's kind of like mumbling, what, like what? But he already thinks about how it could be edited. He already. I mean, in his brain, he's already playing with the actors without telling them that he's going to do this. They have to react to his spontaneous, I want his face off. And Cassavetes would just jump into it and just take note because he's a pro. And that wasn't in there. And I was like, what's going on? And we're behind the monitor. You could see everybody's like watching. And then we're like, wait, what happened? Nobody says a word until the director calls cut. And then they do it again and again and again and it's it's like oh wow and then you get sucked into it even though you're part of the crew you're standing there you've got the the writers you've got other crew members and cinematographer and everyone's like huh what's what's happening here and you're just watching it and i'm like holy fuck that's amazing that is fucking brilliant but you don't think about it until it's kind of like done because he thought about it so this mm -hmm. guy's already 10 steps ahead of everybody else. He's going to direct right. himself in the character that he thinks it's, it's right. And he does it. He's per, I mean, he studies it himself. So when he brings it on set, nobody knows. There's no way I can do that. Then once it's already done, you go to a close up. Yeah, I do this thing. Sure. But he's already done it. And I didn't rehearse it that way because I didn't know he was going to do it. Um, oh man. He is on that. Yeah. Level. And, uh, and you can't, it's hard to second guess him. You know, but you just follow what he does as best as you can. I, I, I just feel like he's that one actor that has directors like, did I did I write this right? Or, or you know what I'm saying? Did I did I direct this right? Like I just oh wow. I mean it's, well, it's amazing. <laughs> since we're in face off, I wanted to ask uh INDB lets us down probably about thirty percent of the time. Fifty percent of the time. Thank you. Um with their trivia. So uh, we saw on your website photos of Nicolas Cage's birthday cake on set. Uh, something that appears to be a running theme I saw across multiple productions. But the um, the trivia states on IMDb that John Woo let Nicolas Cage get all pumped up for a scene before surprising him with the cake. And it resulted in uh, Cage asking Woo, 
not to ever do that again, <laughs> which I personally thought it was just it sounded weird in itself because it wasn't like there was going to be two birthdays. <laughs> like his birthday wasn't going to come around again on the same production. But um, but did you, it looked to me based on the pictures on your website that this is happening on multiple productions and he always seemed pleasantly thrilled by the by the cake it is. So I'm assuming that the the trivia is completely false, but I was wondering if you could confirm that. I did. I've never read any trivia. I only I only know what I saw on set. Uh, I don't know what went on behind the scenes, because I'm always on the set. In all fairness, so mm-hmm. uh, on the set, Nick was extremely gracious and and pleasantly surprised that we did the cake thing. He was unaware that all that stuff was happening. We kind of knew that it was going to happen. But uh, it would just break and then they would do it, like on Scorsese said to Michael Bays and so forth. It just happened to be that we're filming in January in the, you know, on these films. And John Wu and Cage, I would say, are as close as they can possibly be. There was not a second of animosity between them. I think mm-hmm. that those guys were like swinging sisters. They were like buddy buddies the entire time. I don't, you know, the dynamic between those two was, was, it was very close. It was like good buddies, respectable buddies working together. I didn't feel no. anything or saw anything in Wind Talkers or on Face Off. Well, you brought up Wind Talkers. I was going to ask you about that because what now we're, we're on John Woo. What, a few, few years later, you were with John Woo on Wind Talkers. What was it like specifically to work with him? Because it's not just Wind Talkers, it's Face Off. Like, what was it Our work with your heart talk. Thank you. What was it like to work with him? And truthfully, I love this guy. This guy is a very soft spoken man who barely speaks English or at the time he barely spoke English. Mm-hmm. And is just he's all about humor and perfection. Now, this guy dances around everything. He's mm-hmm. smart. He's witty. He knows what he wants out of the shot. Verbally, he doesn't relate as well as he does when it comes to visual motion, it's almost like charades, but he gets his point across and the cinematographer would always collaborate with him. And of course they always had um, producer was Terrence Chang. I also think that he kind of acted as a, as a translator at times. I think they had Sam Raimi on hard target as like a, uh, a, a translation to, to kind of to help direct their, you know, be the uh trans uh translation between you the director and the cast you don't, you ever heard that i i i have no idea i yeah i just yeah he he's he's one of those directors that you can kind of tell that you're watching one of his films before you see his name in the credits because he has just that kind of visionary style especially when you see the doves yeah he's a super but, generous guy and he keeps the set as difficult as the set is i'd say then that's why you know, Wind Talkers was a very hard film logistically and strategically to film in Hawaii. Uh, Face Off was also hard, but there was a dynamic to Face Off that that is my favorite film to have ever worked on. It was so damn tough to be there for five straight months, but it was because of Wu's presence. Remember, the director kind of sets the tone of how right. everyone else is going to feel. If you have a real antsy, fucked up director, um, <laughs> and everyone else is kind of shaky. And that's already happened, of course. But when Wu's there, it's all very relaxed, but very professional. And there's always humor induced into everything. If Wu's there's, uh, like, he like likes that. humor. And, uh, and I like that. He loves humor. And uh, and I think that those two really got along well. And I, and I, I loved working with John Wu. I thought we got along very well. No, no, I, and I can agree with you from every, all the research we've done. It seems like like everything you're saying is from what, everything that we've read. Now, speaking of John's, now we saw out of all the, again, you have some of the greatest photos ever on your page. So uh, we saw a nice photo of you and John Travolta on set. And I've had, me personally, I've had the opportunity of working with John um, on a set of a film called Lonely Hearts that was actually filmed in Florida here. And so I think I can call him John. He shook my hand and said, hey, you're doing great. I was like, well, call me in a few years, John, John boy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, I, w- I want to ask you this. What was your experience like working with Mr. Travolta? I liked him an awful lot. You know, uh, I would say that he was he's always one of these jovial, happy people. He breaks character and gets into this That's whole right. social scene on set a lot. Unlike mm-hmm. Cage, who was very methodical about most everything that he did on set. Travolta was this like, you know, Mr. America. It was like he was a celebrity <laughs> A movie star and an actor, all of the same. <laughs> so when they when they broke, he he goes into this whole 
if people talk to him, he talks, he's this, he's that. I was invited to his trailer a few times, sit down, we have coffee along with, you know, other people in the entourage. And he was just that guy. I was like, come on over, sit down, have lunch at the trailer, shoot the shit. He's just like this all the time. The opposite was within a cage who was very into his role and into his character and stuff and kind of reserved the energy for what he was doing on set uh, versus exuding all energy as Travolta was, but he just, he went on and on and on. He was just, he was like an octopus all the time. Is it, is it true that uh, there was like a, a little bit of an overlap in production between face off and Con Air? Yes. Hmm. How, how much of an overlap? Like how, uh, I'm just, I'm very interested in, in uh, uh, the, to do one movie is a lot of work, but to do two films at the same time and especially two action films where you're one the with lead. a mullet and one with no mullet yeah it's <laughs> a lot going on yeah so what was it like a like a month or a few weeks or to, to what i remember and what i understand i think it was a maximum of two weeks they started shooting travolta scenes anything to do with gt ex- anything that excluded cage they were filming including some some, some stunt stuff and I think it was about a two week overlap. We had run way over on Con Air. And, uh, and, and at that point they couldn't, they were running out of things to film without Cage. So they said, you have to come on. So we were working on two film sets at the same time. The hours were like 18 hour days. It was quite insane. Wow. You had your hair, makeup, wardrobe people completely derobing him putting him into the face-off look and then flying, putting him back into the cock. And it was insane to go back and forth. And I was at method standard to also flip back and forth. And it was really exhausting. Did you guys wear the same hairpiece? Uh, we oh, did. Yeah. Well, I didn't have his hairpiece. I had like the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, your turn. <laughs> you know, I, was, I had the, the stunt guy's hairpiece uh, as needed, you know, at a certain right, point. Right. You don't really need it because now they know how to light it. So you don't have right. to go through all that trouble. But it was a lot of stuff because we were immediately went on stage um, for Face Off and we were still doing Con Air. So you would over, we'd finish one film and then go on to the next set. And it was kind of crazy. And the locations were all over the place. I think I was so exhausted just being there because I was a crew member. I was a crew member on two crews. And that lasted several days for that part of it um, mm. until we were finally done with Con Air. So, and if you're doing two productions, that's, then when, where's the sleep? <laughs> there wasn't any. That's wild. And here's the thing. He never fucking complains. I complain that's like awesome. a person. He didn't <laughs> never, whether you're sick, you're tired, you're this, you're that, blah, blah. It didn't matter what it was. He just rolled with it. Hey, Nick, you're standing is complaining. He's fine because I'm fine. We're fine. <laughs> I, I was a diva. People complained about me for complaining because I was a fucking diva. I was like, dude, I'm exhausted. They're like, shut well, up. The actor's not complaining. Well, Why are you complaining? I do know one time that he did complain, and this is one t- one of the actually one of the times I told you that one of my favorite scenes of the film uh, for Face Off. Um, after no, 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 you don't know though. Well, I don't. I, IMDb fact. Well, it's IMDb fact. Well, IMT me thinks it was one of the best scenes in the film. Uh, it, it, IMDb does say we're 50 50 here that Nicolas Cage was so disgusted by the makeup for his faceless scene when his face was removed that John Wu had to remove any reflective surfaces from the line of sight. But me and him, when we did the, the pre- re- review of the film, I said one of my favorite scenes was in the glasses of the doctor, you saw a bloody Castor Troy. And that's one of my favorite scenes of the film because he almost looks like Heath Led- Ledger in the Joker with the fucking smile and smoking the cigarette. I love that shit. I do too. I loved it. I, I actually don't know the backstory of that. The backstory mm. would be a better question with the uh, the writers. Uh, right. They were there yeah. every single day. They're actually friends of mine, and uh, they were on set every single day. And John Wu wanted them on set. They're great guys, and they were co-producers, the creators, and the writers of of the thing. So they would have the right answer. Well, I will say this: we did one of the things me and him both appreciated about the film was that a lot of things were done practically. It wasn't a lot of CGI. Mm-hmm. I mean, most films around the time of Racer and a lot of the films were going so CGI with a lot of things, but Face Off really kept it practical, even with the the plane scene. What, what, what were you, you, you didn't think I was going to bring up a Racer? Racer is like that's that's where that's because that was done around the same time. Those fucking alligators got on my fucking nerves. In the uh, I was, uh, Fight Club. 
Uh, but there wasn't uh, there wasn't a lot of CGI in Fight Club. I'm, there the, the, was n- n- no no it wasn't. It was like, kid- it was just a weird reference. You just met me at a w- <laughs> weird time in my life. All right, whatever. Um, that, that really yeah. threw me. Did it? Well, uh, I'm gonna take this question. Take please. We, in each episode, we kind of go through our favorite scenes from the movie. What was your favorite scene in Face Off? You know, I hate to be so generic, but I'm gonna say when he does that whole Face Off thing in the loft. That was my favorite scene because it wasn't in the script and he executed it brilliantly. (laughs) As much respect as you have for this man, you get, you, you develop even more respect for him. And I felt so proud to be on that set and to be thinking, look at me, I'm working for this guy, this guy. And who I would never in a billion years come near, you know, in, in terms of understanding what he does. And I just felt really privileged to be on that set. So I would say that scene was my favorite. And and being in that loft was just great. I I have this line that he knows what I'm getting ready to say here. I have this line that I always say, especially when me and him are filming, is I don't read the script. The script reads me. There is only one other actor in this world that can use that. And that is Nicolas Cage because he embodies it. So, yeah, I agree. Usually that's such a pet peeve of mine when they say the title of the movie in the the, movie in a way. Oh, I told you I got mad at you about that. Two credits. But. He he made it work in that scene. No, there's, wh- a, there's a degree of self awareness to it. I want to take his face. What about when the when when James Brown is playing in the background and John Travolta says Papa's got a brand new bag? I'm like, they're playing that. I don't need you to say that to me right now. But okay, I get it. I get it. Nicholas Stage can pull it off though. Yeah, he can. Yeah, that's a great scene. And then as far as the production as a whole, what do you have a favorite memory in particular from the Face Off production? I I loved being next to John Wu on the monitor and watching and learning, I will say that, that to me was probably the biggest honor of, uh, of, of my stand in film career. The fact that he invited me to sit next to him often um, Mm -hmm. and like next to him as if I was his son. Uh, It was very strange to have that dynamic to be the stand in, but they saw how seriously I took everything and how everything should be done right. And, and I think that he respected that. So I would say that that was probably my favorite thing that happened in terms of closeness. I, I developed a bunch of close relationships with different people on that film set, uh, including my friend Mary, whose house I'm sitting in, who designed the wigs for Nick Cage, who's brilliant, and, and did that and did his hair on that entire film. But, uh, but just being there and watching John Wu and having him ask me questions or to go through the motion and him trusting me to be Nick Cage, even though I'm physically a lot heavier at this point, uh, or at that point, that made me feel like I was included in the VIP list. You know, it's yeah. a real big deal. You don't get that in the in the uh, in the position of a stand-in, guys. This was a very privileged moment. I recognize it as a privileged moment, and uh, and I worked and I respected it, and and that to me was a big deal. I'm, I'm glad that you said that because we've interviewed over at this point over 75 guests and there's only a few guests who've said what you've said and, and I agree with it. When you're on set, it doesn't matter whether you're a stand-in or cinematographer, craft services, if someone invites you to do something, they'll soak up all that knowledge because being in film is like being on a golf course. You're going to need more than one club and you better know how to use all of them and that way you it's about the end game, it's about the long game. So clearly... Like, I don't, I don't like that you said you're not a great actor, you're not this great talent, because at the end of the day, I mean, that's how you feel. But if I'm a great director, I can still use you in the way that I need to use you because you are, appreciate what it takes to do what's being done. Yeah. So keep it up. If I ever cast you, you won't be Nick Cage to stand in. I just want to tell you that right now. I'll just tell you that. But let me ask them. I will say this before we move on from Face Off. Is there anything that you want to tell people about the film that they may not know, that may not be on IMDb or that they've never heard? Is there anything that you want to exclusively break on this show about Face Off? Well, that's not IMDb. I mean, I'm just trying to think of the, like, the general actors and so forth. There was a lot of harmony between the actors. Uh, a lot of downtime because of the setups were just endless, endless, endless setups. Mm-hmm. The stunt guys had their work cut out for them that you may or may not understand, um, especially in the boat scene. Those guys were crazy. And I was on sorry. that scene as well. Uh, I was never on that set. I just want you to okay. know. I, I never made it to Thank the you. boat set because it was all stunt. Stunt and actors had nothing to do mm-hmm. with us. 
So uh, to be very clear, it was all. Well, I'm sorry. You see us both like chomping at the bit to say, listen, you did such a great job. We knew that was not you at the boat scene because we both were like, now, wait a goddamn minute now. Hold on. That was the one funny moment. You don't want a two year old horn guys or anything kind of weird because the stunt guys were great stunt guys and they did it. They were. Oh, I wouldn't and do it. During those scenes, us stand-ins were just on the sidelines doing photo double insert shots on another right. on, a, on another unit. And while right. they went and did all their serious work with stunts, which was quite serious because it was dangerous, um, right. that was with the director and actors and stunt guys. That There's no reason to drag this luggage onto that. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Oh, see, that wasn't CGI, David. That wasn't, see, that's what I'm trying to tell you. But what we, one oh, thing I didn't you, say was CGI. you did not, but one thing you did not, I don't even know if you noticed this. We, we, again, you say we were film buffs. Like, okay, so we're dressed as priests, which can be considered, I guess, Catholic, somewhat religious Jesus. The one thing that we really love that Nicolas Cage is not standing stunt double, technically walked on water. Doing that scene on the boat, because remember he got up and he was like riding on water on the side of the boat. We we're like, wait a minute, this, this <laughs> Jesus priest is riding or walking on water. Shoes too. Well, you saw yeah, that. I didn't. This is awesome, brother. Let's do it again sometime. Okay, I really appreciate it. I, I love it. You guys are amazing. Thank, thank you, Varka. You, you too. Thank you, thank you so much. It was much, a great man. talking to you. And once again, we would like to thank our guests. They killed it. They nailed it. And I mean, uh, home improvement. They nailed it, Benford. <laughs> Royal, take us away. All right, I'm gonna sound like you on this one because I would have changed the. If ending. you do a white voice, I'm gonna fucking fuck you up. I would have changed the ending. I would have changed the ending. It, well, it, I know why you explained it to me. I didn't even know he like DCF was looking for this kid because I didn't think about it when I watched it. Yeah, like, no where was he? That needs to be where, done here. He wasn't with him because you remember the window was hip high, yeah. and that kid was not. Where is he? What that was was studio interference saying, no, we want a nice little bow tied around this thing. We want everything but, to work out. But let me let me challenge you on that one time. The only thing that made me think about that was this, is that I don't know if that really was the ending. And the only reason why I say that that shot is so blown out that maybe that was her dreaming. That's what I want to think. Cause he's so cheesy. It's this, that is like, like, that's what I want. If they would have did that, that would have made it perfect to me. But I don't think that's what really happened. I just, uh, it, 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 was, it wasn't, you, you, did you see how blown out it was? So hazy, so mm -hmm. heavenly. Like, yeah. he came back with that weird CGI smile, even though it was a practical shot, it looked CGI. Yeah. <laughs> it was very. And the kid came out of nowhere. That's what I'm saying. It almost had a dream feel to it. So if that's the case, it's brilliant, but that's not really what I think they were going for. John Boy. John Boy. Yeah, that, that, the ending, it, it, it didn't ruin the movie by any stretch. Oh, no. The whole movie, the ending is tongue in cheek, and mm -hmm. the whole movie is, is kind yeah. of tongue in cheek. So it fit in, but I think they really could have. They really could have like put the put a, a stamp on it perfectly if they would have went with John Woo's ending that was a little bit more mysterious and set like it up that. for a possible sequel. I know you asked me not to look in your book, but I actually did a catch, catch a glimpse of something earlier, and I, I thought I think it was one of your connections. It was that Jesus really did walk on water. He was a priest, and then he really got on that boat and was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In his church shoes, nonetheless. <laughs> That was, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to say that that was unrealistic because all the stunts were done practically. So a man actually did that. Right, so but not is, that man. Feasible, but that yeah, wasn't the man was driving crazy. the boat. Like, 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 come on, bro. And how, how strong was he to just to be hanging on the side of that boat? And, and he pulled himself back yeah. up. Like the forces of centrific nature. I'm sorry, I'm, I almost did one of your royalisms there. It, it, it should not be happening. No. Yeah, so that's what I would have changed. Like those those stuntmen, this whole stunt scene at the end was unnecessary. I didn't need all of that. Like you guys have already done so much. It was, and it, it, I just didn't need that. So again, only thing I, like you were talking about what we would change. I would just would have changed that. I don't need you to do all of that. You've already had such a, see here's the thing. When you do something brilliant, it was an idea that we really hadn't seen. We've, we've seen people switch bodies before, but they literally took their faces off of each other. And that was a brilliant thing. And we, we allowed a lot of liberties with this film. I don't need you to action it up at the end. It's already the nineties. You're already giving me two golden glocks. Every time somebody shoots somebody, they got to jump. It's no more. And it seems like Castro Troy is a sniper, except when he's trying to hit John Travolta. I would have changed that too. He's yeah. hitting everybody. One shot, one kill. One shot, one kill. Oh, John boy, I can't get you. Well, um, yeah. well, 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 don't bury the lead. Literally. Yes. That's what that came from. Don't bury the lead. <laughs> <laughs> 
they did a great job at making you feel the gravity of the situation. Like for being a uh, a nineties action film, they did a really good job in setting up the story. Because for me, what makes a great action movie is a great revenge story. You have to set up the perfect plot for bloodthirst revenge, and this movie did it did it perfectly. I mean, you have I mean, right off the top, you're you're killing a kid. So immediately, like, I want that guy. But then they also keep they keep the bad guy a little neutral because he wasn't trying to kill the kid. It doesn't change the fact that he did. I love that. That's one thing we never... I love it because he said... He it, said it in, in the beginning, he was like, oh, too. shit, I didn't mean to do that. frustrated there, like, you couldn't <laughs> let, let it go. go. I wasn't trying to He's kill like, why don't you just kill yourself or something <laughs> like that? <laughs> but you, but they, I, I'm glad you brought it up. They showed that at the beginning. When he shot him, he was like, what the fuck, dude? That's why I waited. For yeah. Y'all were both in the shot. And why are you hugging him so close? Why are you putting his heart next to your heart? Yeah. Like, he was like... But they, they did a great great job it said and then and then they take it a few steps further by uh you know the whole scenario which is like they had to take some crazy leaps in the screen in the screenwriting to avoid plot holes in this whole scenario where it's a black ops uh, a black operation they uh, black, black, black ops sure and they don't make me tell you about your they're, people they're sending nicola they're sending john travolta to jail as nicholas cage he gets stuck in the prison and you really feel the gravity that's true like holy shit he is fucked the only people that know that he isn't him are the people are dead or bad. So he is like trapped in a, a high security prison. I think that they should, to me, they, to me, that would, I will say that's what I would have changed. No, I love that. Don't get me wrong. I think they should have expanded that a little bit more. Cause he was only in jail a few days. Like that, that, I, that, I mean, that couldn't expand it too much. You would, the movie didn't actually. They, they, but they my spent point, an hour setting up the movie before. I get that, but but I just like to me, the first surgery took an hour. All of a sudden, his face, John Travolta, with Nick Nick Cage's John Travolta, just shows up. Yeah. Oh well, that I love that moment. Oh, I love that moment now. How he's just leaning like, against because, the. Because could you just imagine it from? Because he thought um, that was the people coming to get him out. Sean Archer's just, perspective. Right, like, wait you see yourself walk in. Oh, they, and and John Woo is a great director because he really knows how to utilize. Slow motion is something that could be easily abused in editing, but John Woo knows how to use it in those strategic moments that are a little bit like there. It's it's not where you'd expect to see see slow motion, but when John when John Travolta walks in and there's that moment, you just you feel again the gravity of the situation that like how fucked he really is, and you and even though you know this is a late '90s action film that everything's going to work out in the end, they still succeeded through the whole beginning of making you feel the peril of the situation, of, of the, the hopelessness. Like, for a, a split, for a few split seconds here and there, I actually believed, oh, shit, he might really be fucked. He might not be able to get out of this prison and get his wife back and save the day. For an action film where you know inherently that that's not going to be the case, for them to still they made you believe it. trick you into that mindset, even for a moment... And uh, that is uh, and hats off to them. They did a really good job. Amazing job. And I'll, I'll give you that because, again, that's that's Which a scare moment. makes the action that much sweeter because mm -hmm. you're like, you, you're you bloodthirsty. You want, like, this dude killed your kid. He fucked your wife as you with your face. He fucked your wife with your human face on. Oh, yeah. Put put the spear in it. With that being said, I don't, I, you know, I don't I don't have a soliloquy, so I'm, I, I want you to give your answer. But I want to say how many fucks I give it in there because I don't want to know what you have, how many you have. I just want to tell you. I'm going to, I'm, I, I, I graded this on, does it stand the test of time? I graded it on writing and I, I, I had to keep in mind this was a nineties action thing, drama. I, I, I don't mean I, to cut you off, but what I do want to say is that Nicholas Cage has said that this is I'm his. Sorry, was that Nicholas Cage? Nick what did you say? I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> 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 Nicholas Cage has said <laughs> This is his favorite film. Touche, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I give it a four. I give this film a four. Okay. I give him give it a four. I can't help but notice that. Are you okay. noticing or I'm noticing? We no, thank you. Thank oh, you. that that's that's okay. I don't have to worry about that today. Okay. I give it a three point five. Okay. As the point five more than I stupidly, stupidly, stupidly gave the French Dispatch. So stupid of me. Well, you had met me at a different time in life back then. But I give it a 3.5 because uh, I wouldn't expect any late 90s, early 2000s um, action film with the main priority being 
balls to the wall action. I wouldn't expect any of those films to be a five. To me, right. a, a three point five is a five. It's almost incapable of being a five. Not this film, but like nineties ball. But with that being said, it's like you said. What I thought you were going to say was I wouldn't expect a nineties action film to be that intelligent. And it was, and it was intelligent and just fucking bonkers because like it, what's what I really appreciate about this movie is that one, you know what you're getting when you go into it Mm -hmm. and you get a little bit more than that and you're surprised and pleasantly surprised. But what's wild is like, if you were to just tell me the premise of this movie on paper, like there's no fucking and way. they're gonna that make this ridiculous. Yeah, and, and, and they then would, you watch it and it actually but, plays. But it's okay because only certain people can pull off ridiculous. Yeah, and those are the two. They got the two. Right, and like it's like right when you're at the, the height of the film and you're like wondering what's gonna happen. Like, oh no, nah, is he gonna kill his daughter? All, all of a sudden, they bring you back to reality as he licks his daughter's face or something like. It's like yeah. Okay, she wants to take her face off now. But uh, yeah, no, I hey, I give it a four. You give it a 3.5. Let's put that on the screen. Do the ma- Why don't you do the math today? I'll, I'll, I'll try. 3.5 plus 4 is 7.5. Divided by 2 is... Hit the equal button. 3.75. Out of 5. That's, 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 solid. that's, that's very solid. It, it, right. Now, would you say... Have you seen Hard Target with JCVD? No. Okay. Not you. all of it. Not all of it. So I can't intelligently speak on that. But what I will say is this is that if you if I, if I had to get a top 10 movies to take with me on an island of to, of 90s, it would be one of those 10. Let's, I would want that. Let's play this game. John Woo made another action film with John Travolta in around this time called uh Broken Arrow. I know of I know of the film. I have not seen that one either. Okay. Then we can't play. No, we can't play that game. It's just John Tavolsha in action. Would you choose uh, Con Air or Face Off? <sighs> Con Air. I'm. I'm. A, I, yeah. I'm just sorry. The uh, day of the because, the day of the dog. Yeah. They got, they got, they got semi. Right. 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 Rings, right. Right. Uh, it's just it's, fucking. What's his name? John Malkovich. Right. Yeah. No. You you had me at John Malkovich, and then like I say, you got Bubba from Forrest Gump. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole this whole movie rests. They're gonna call me Johnny Thirty Eight yeah. after this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah, that, but, but I mean, again, though, but it, there's still, I mean. What a great, what a great little window of time mm-hmm. for just shut your brain off and have a good time. Yeah, you theater. don't have to think. You you just go into it and, and you know. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? So guys, I will put it in the comments. What would you give it? Clearly, there's no, no, no tweeners are here. Uh, this is everybody 30 and up here. So all my face off fans, hey, tell us what you think. I, I didn't think we'd get to this point. That's what the number two pencil said. Uh, two films left this season. Number one, Blades of Glory. And my favorite film, Dead Presidents. Actually, your mom's favorite film. Or my mom's favorite film. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I just have some... Your mom's are worded yeah yeah she yeah she but she thought she was That's watching something understanding it was the day that we'll save for that episode yeah we need to get back into our own oh, bodies for that bitch. episode <laughs> oh my god You're, whose mom are you talking about i don't even know <laughs> uh, got between the blue moon and this character i have no idea what the fuck hey royal i gotta tell you man it's, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to get back on that side of the desk. I'll just What's say, happening is, over there? You got too much room? I'm, I'm just... Are you gonna? I'll ask you this. I'll ask you this. Will you? Will this be the last blue moon you ever partake in this year? Oh no! The blue moon was my favorite part of this whole thing. Gotcha. I, I enjoyed this Al Capone. I even had a puff of your your cigarette. Blue moon. But it, I. But you found the right size, so you don't even need the tall boy. That's just perfect for you. It's just a no, good the way size. My personality works. I'll be at a tall boy by next month. There you go. All right, guys. Well, listen. Seeing Dick. I don't know why, and he's not talking about Cheney. Guys, that's the episode. And hey. God. Damn it. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer. All right, Peter.